Hey guys, welcome to my beginner's course on Linux. I'm delighted that you gave me this opportunity to guide you on the path of becoming an expert on Linux. In this course, I will tell you what Linux is and then we'll discuss some basic terms like repositories or repos in short and distributions or distros. Later, we'll download VirtualBox which is a free and open source application to run virtual machines on your computer or your laptop and then we'll install Ubuntu Linux on it so that you have your own lab system. In the next section, we'll move on to talk about some command line basics like ls, file and directory operations, etc. We will also talk about users and groups and how you can manage access permissions in your Linux deployment. And then we'll move on to talk about some utilities like search using find and grep command, how you can compress and decompress files using tar, and how you can scheduling tasks using the cron type utility. In the following lecture, I will show you how to install and manage applications and services on Linux and then we'll have a look at some networking options available for us in Linux. I will also show you how to mount a file system on Linux. In the last section, I will show you the basics of batch scripting and we'll finish off the course by learning how you can troubleshoot issues in your Linux deployment. Now a bit about myself, my name is Vikas and I have been an IT engineer for over 12 years now. Over this time, I've worked in various technologies like networking, system management, DevOps, and more recently, cybersecurity and big data. In the end, a small note from my side, please leave your feedback at the end of this course as it will help me improve the quality of my content and keep me motivated. With this, we have come to the end of this section. I will see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hello and welcome everyone. Let's talk about some basics before we get our hands dirty as this will set the foundation for our upcoming lectures. Now, to someone who's not familiar with IT, the first question that might pop up in his or her mind when they hear the term Linux is, what is it? And a simple answer would be that Linux is an operating system. An operating system is a software that manages communication between the software applications, for example, web browsers, text editors, etc., and the hardware resources, for example, CPU, RAM, and other peripherals. Linux is different in a way that it is distributed under an open source license model which means users can run it for any purpose. They can study how it works, they can modify it and they can redistribute copies of the original or the modified version. To understand this definition better, let's have a look at this image. At the core of your system is your hardware which means your CPU, RAM, storage, other peripherals. To manage and interact with this hardware, you have a software piece called a kernel. This is the core of your system and this is actually the piece that is called Linux. Now to interact with this kernel in Linux world you have a command line interface called a shell and this shell allows you to control your computer via commands typed into its text interface. And then on top of that you have your user space which is nothing but a space for each user to store their files and install their applications and these are mutually as isolated from each other so the user space for user A will be isolated from the user space for user B so user A cannot know what processes user B is running now all of this is called a Linux distribution a Linux distribution often abbreviated as a distro is an operating system made from a Linux kernel and a collection of tools and a package management system. Now, we now know what a Linux kernel is. A software package is nothing but archive files which contains compiled binaries and other resources that make up a software. And a package management system allows you to install, uninstall and update softwares on a Linux system. And that brings us to the question, where do you get these software packages from? You get them from online databases called repositories or repos. A repository is nothing but a database of application installation packages that you can download using commands such as apt-get for Ubuntu and yum for Red Hat. You can also create your own repositories if you so like. But generally, by default, when you install a Linux distro, your software center comes pre-configured with a repo. Now, we have a lot of distributions 
for Linux available and each distribution serves its own specific purpose. For example, I downloaded an uh, image from the internet which has a timeline of various different uh, distributions of Linux. So if you look at it, we have Debian here, we have the timeline here and as you can see each of these little lines is a Linux distribution specifically catering to a specific use case. For example, Kali Linux is a distribution which basically caters for pen testing etc. So if I search for Kali Linux, we can see that Kali Linux is a Debian derived Linux distro designed for digital forensics and penetration testing. Similar way if we look at Ubuntu, We'll know that Ubuntu is a free and open source of OS and Linux distribution based on, based on Debian and it is distributed under three official versions. Ubuntu desktop which gives you a desktop like um, uh, Windows like GUI interface, Ubuntu server which is used for servers and Ubuntu cloud. Similarly if we look at OpenSUSE We now know that OpenSUSE or SUSE Linux is a Linux based distribution sponsored by SUSE Linux GmbH, GmbH and other companies. Now I've also downloaded this image which has some famous um, distributions for Linux. One sec, this photo come up, oops, hang on. Let's do this Linux distributions and you can say we have Arch Linux, CentOS, Elementary OS, Zorin. So if we open up the TechMint article, you'll see various distributions. So Arch Linux. looks like this, CentOS looks like this, Elementary, Zorin, Fedora. And if you go through all of these, you'll know that each Linux distribution caters for a specific use case and tries to solve a specific problem. And therefore, we've got so many different, uh, different distributions which you can choose from depending on what you really want. And with that, we have come to the end of our lecture. I will see you in the next lecture. Bye. Welcome. In this lecture, you will download and install VirtualBox on a Windows 10 host operating system. So to start, you will need to go to HTTPS virtualbox.org. That should take you to this page. Once here, you can click on download VirtualBox and that should take you to the downloads page. On the downloads page, you will see a list of packages for different host operating systems. Because we are installing it on a Windows host, I'll click on Windows hosts. But if you're doing it on Linux or Mac or Solaris, you can choose those. That should automatically start the download, but I'll cancel out of it because I've already downloaded VirtualBox. Once you've done the download, then you need to go to your local file system where you've downloaded this um, package. I've done it right here and then double click on the package. That should start the installer and you can click next here, just next, next here as well. You can click yes and then install. That should start the installation. Now it's asking me to provide my admin username and password. So I'll click yes here and that should start the installation right away. This is a pretty quick installation. So we'll just wait for it to complete. I think it's almost done.
You can also download other things for VirtualBox if you like, like its SDKs, some extension packs. Meanwhile, um, the installation is finished, so I'll click on finish. I'll untick this first because I don't want um, VirtualBox to start right after my installation. But if you want, you can click it, click, and it'll start the application right away. I click finish here. And I can see that the virtual box icon is here. So this is it for this lecture. Thank you for watching. All right, time to create your first virtual machine. You can do this by first going to virtual box manager, which is the application you'll use to install and manage your virtual machines. You can create a new virtual machine in three ways. You can click new here. Or you can go to machine and then click new or you can type in control n from your windows machine so i'll click new here i need to give it a name and specify what operating system i will install on this virtual machine so i can type in windows and it will automatically type the type and version information or i can type in ubuntu and it should change the type and version to ubuntu so we'll be in installing Ubuntu for this demo and I'll click on next. Oh, it's giving me the error because I already have an Ubuntu. So I'll just call it dash one and I can click on next. Here I need to give it some memory. So I can do that by either moving the slider or I can install memory by typing it in here. So I can say 2048 and it's gonna give it two gigabytes of RAM. Now, a small note, you should never allocate more than 75% of total resources available for your host to all the virtual machines running simultaneously on your host. For example, if I have a laptop which has 8 gigabytes of memory, then I should not allocate more than 6 gigabytes to all the virtual machines that will be run simultaneously on my laptop. If I do that, I could experience slowness, system crashes, or some other errors. But I've got an 8 gig machine and I'm just allocating it 2048 MB or 2 gigabytes, so I should be fine. So I'll click next. Now if it is asking if I already have a virtual disk or if I want to create a new one. I need a new virtual disk. So I'll click create. Now it's asking me to tell it the file type I want to use. There are three options VDI, VHD, VMDK. VDI is the native file format for VirtualBox. VHD is supported by Microsoft and VMDK is supported by VMware. Now, if you want to go for VHD or VMDK, you might experience that some features are either not supported or not available on VirtualBox. So I will leave it as VDI for now and I'll click on next. Now I need to specify the storage type. There are two storage types, dynamically allocated and fixed type. Dynamically allocated will only use the space as it consumes. So even if I have, let's say, allocated 32 gigabytes to my virtual machine, but I'm only consuming, which means I only have files worth 10 gigabytes on that virtual machine, it will consume 10 gigabytes on the host machine. Whereas in fixed size, if I specify 32 gigabytes, it will always consume 32 gigabytes. takes a bit of time to set up a fixed size hard disk but once it's set up in some scenarios it is faster to use for the purpose of this demonstration I'll keep it as dynamically allocated and I'll click on next now I can specify where I want to store my hard disk it is generally stored under your username VirtualBox VMs and then your VM name that's the default file path 
for VirtualBox to store their virtual machines. But if I want to change it from the default path, I can specify it. So let's say if I want to save it under my OneDrive, I can go OneDrive and save it under there. But I don't want to do it, so I'll cancel out of this. Here I can specify the storage space allocated to this virtual machine. I'm going to give it 32 gigs and I'm going to click create. Now it has created my new virtual machine and what I can do now is I can go settings. Again three ways I can right click and click settings or use the settings icon up at the top or I could have gone machine and then settings. So machine and then settings. Here I need to go to storage and then I need to click on this empty CD icon which will take me to the optical drive and I need to click on this little CD here and then choose virtual optical drive and can then need to specify the ISO. Now this is akin to putting your operating system CD in the optical drive of your physical machine. Now I can click OK now and I can click start to start the installation of Ubuntu. Now for those of you who do not have an operating system image ready, what you can do is you can go to ubuntu.com slash downloads slash desktop or you could go to ubuntu.com and you can download a copy of Ubuntu from here. So you've got various options. If you click on Ubuntu desktop which we will be installing in this demo, you can then click download here. It is a free open source software. So it is good for your lab systems and in some cases production systems as well. Now our virtual machine is booting up. One thing to note here is that this little piece of information this little piece of information this is called the host key now what normally happens is if you have an operating system that does not suppose mouse pointer integration and you're doing something in the host op in the guest operating system and your mouse is captured by the guest operating system now to get the mouse back onto host operating system I need to click on this host key so if this was an operating system that would not support mouse pointer integration and I'm in here then I need to click on right control to get out so for example you're doing something here right you're typing something on the browser you're clicking something or you're just playing playing your YouTube videos and just going through the playlist now you want to come out of that machine and shut down because you've completed your work you'll have to click right control and you'll get control on the host operating system so from here back into the installation we need to choose the language we leave English as default then we can click on install Ubuntu and that should start the installation now we need to choose the keyboard layout we leave it as default we can click on continue Now, we can either do a normal installation, so it's going to install some web browsers, utility, office software, games, media players, all those things. Or I can just do a minimal installation, which is faster, but it's going to get installed less number of items on my machine. But I can always um, download and install these later if I want. Download updates. will download some updates while it's installing, so I don't have to update my system after installation. I could also install some third-party softwares for graphics and high Wi-Fi but I leave it in minimal installation and then I'll check that and I can click on continue and it's asking me if it wants to erase disk and install Ubuntu um, because we've, it's a new disk we can click that if we wanted to partition the disk we could have gone something else and we could have partitioned the disk but I just want to erase disk now so remember this is not the host operating system disk this is the virtual hard disk we allocated for this virtual machine so 
it's going to use the free space on my host operating system anyway so i'm going to click continue and that's my time zone correctly so no problem you need to specify a name here and password oh I had the caps on now passwords are really important for the machines that will be connected to internet so make sure you've got a secure password if I click on login automatically it's gonna log in log me in automatically every time if I say require my password this is more secure so if your machine is connecting to internet just make sure you require a password every time to log in it's a bit of an hassle but it's more safe and secure now it's starting the installation what I'll do now is I'm gonna pause the video and I will resume once it's finished installation all right welcome back so Ubuntu in is installed on my virtual machine and what I can do now is I can safely shut down the virtual machine or I can either keep using it so that's it for this lecture um, thanks a lot and I will see you in the next one hi welcome back guys we have installed VirtualBox on our computer and we have created a virtual machine with Ubuntu Linux installed on it now let's go over some features available to us through the Ubuntu desktop user interface on the left hand side this is the taskbar and it has your favorite applications listed on it so for example I've got Firefox web browser a file browser which is like a Microsoft style um, file browser I've got Ubuntu software which is a software center for Ubuntu so if I have to install any software I just have to click on the search bar here search for that software name and it will show up related matches click on that software and click on install and this should start installing softwares on my machine and then help will um, show the Ubuntu desktop guide which I can use to search various things for example if I want to know how to start an application I can read the article on starting applications the next icon I've got here is terminal which we'll use for the majority of this course so this is the command line interface to do various activities but we'll close out for, for now and then I've got this icon which takes me to Amazon website now to remove anything from this favorite taskbar all you've got to do is right click on that click on remove from favorites to add anything onto this we have to go to this little icon that says show application this will show all the applications installed on our um, machine this is tabbed into two windows so there's a frequent window which shows your frequently utilized applications and an all window which has all your applications so let's say I want to add to do to my favorites so I'll right click on to do and click on add to favorites and this will pop up here and I have a notification that to do has been added to my favorites I also want to add settings so I'll click on settings and I want to add backups so I'll click on add to favorites I want to also add system manager so and I can keep on adding as many things as I want now going back to the desktop on the top right we've got three icons network sound and battery so if I click on any of these here it'll show a sound volume changer this will show what network connection I am on and the state of that network connection for example I'm on a wired connection and I'm connected to internet I can change the settings through here or I can turn off this connection 
this shows my battery so I've got 92% battery available and I can change my power settings from here and the last icon on the list is the current user that's logged in I can switch user from here I can log out or I can go to account settings to view user settings this button will take me to system settings so I can use this to go to system settings like this this button will lock the screen for me so if I click on that my screen is locked and I can re-authenticate log back in so if you wanna if you're working on anything and if you wanna go on a coffee break lock your screen and move go away and then you come back and you have to put your password in going back this button will actually allow us to restart or power off the machine so we'll cancel out of that next we'll go into settings and have an overview of what settings are available to us so I can change my Wi-Fi settings because I have only one connection I don't have Wi-Fi available I can change my Bluetooth settings I can change background and lock screen to change the background and lock screen wallpaper so let's do that so I want to use this as my background so I'll select this and I'm going to do something else for my lock screen so let's say I'm going to do this this should actually yep that's changed my um, background and let's test if it's changed my lock screen as well so we locked it and just as you can see it's changed my lock screen as well now dock will allow me to auto hide the dock so if I turn it on it will auto hide the dock and I can change the icon size I can make them smaller or larger whatever I choose so I'll go for a smaller size icons and I can change the position on screen from left bottom or right so I'll keep it at bottom notifications will allow me to choose which applications I want to notify me something for example if I'm installing something from the software center I'll go there install it and I'll you know go away and do something else on my let's say I'm writing a report on my LibreOffice writer I want to install a software I'll go to software in center install it just click on the install button go back to my LibreOffice writer and once that installation is finished it will pop up here I don't know if you noticed it it did that so let's give it a go again so I'll go to software center go back to the list of the I had so I want to install notes click on this and we'll open up the settings menu we'll see if it pops up so you can enable system wide notifications from here or see so it's given me this pop up we can enable system wide notifications from here and we can enable lock screen notifications from here if you don't want lock screen notifications I'll turn this off I like this because if my screen is locked that means I'm not working on it anymore and I don't want other people to know what I was doing so I don't want lock screen notifications but I do want notification pop ups so applications you can choose which applications can notify you for example if you want to know if a backup is completed or not you can change those settings from here language and region will allow you to um, set up your language or uh, whatever region are you in online accounts will allow you to connect your online accounts to your machi machine privacy will allow you to change some privacy settings sharing will allow you to toggle screen sharing on or off sound will allow you to change sound settings for example what output device you're going to use what input device you want to use um, volumes etc power will allow you to change what you want to do when you're in a power saving mode so for example in power saving mode how 
how soon I want the blank screen to pop up. So if I want to do it never, I can go never or go two minutes. And what happens when I click on suspend and power button? It says automatic suspend on battery power when the delay is 20 minutes. Network will allow me to change my um, network adapter configuration. So if I want to change the wired connections configuration, I can click on this little icon here and it allows me to give it a manual or automatic IP from DHCP. I can set up my security settings here. VPN will allow you to set up a VPN. So I can import VPN settings from a file or if I want to set up PPTP, I can set up a PPTP connection from here. And network proxy will allow me to set up a network proxy. So if I click on settings, I can click on automatic and provide a configuration URL for network proxy or I can click on manual and configure manual proxy. I don't have a proxy set so I'll click on disabled. Devices will allow you to change your keyboard shortcuts etc. And what you want to do when uh, removable media is inserted. So we'll go back. Details will allow you to show some system details like what Operating system level are you on, how much memory you've got, etc. Date and time will allow you to set how you want to get date and time for your system. I've got it set up as automatic, which means it connects some publicly available NTP servers and gets the date and time from there. But you can disable it and set up your own date and time if you so choose. Users will allow you to see what users, so I can see. I've got two users on my machine, Labit and Vikas, and I can see what account type and I can change the password if I so choose. So this is it from the settings menu. Now this brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you liked it. I will see you in the next lecture. Bye. Welcome back guys. Let's talk about Linux command line interface called shell or terminal in this lecture. Shell is a program that receives commands from the user and returns the output on screen. Linux distributions may have a GUI interface, but at its core, Linux has a command line interface or a CLI interface. To open the terminal in Ubuntu, you can type in the shortcut Control Alt T, and this will open up terminal for you, or you can open it up from the favorites. And if you don't know how it got into the favorites, you have to go back to my um, previous video and watch um, the part where I've shown how to add and remove things from your favorites. And also, you can go to show applications and start the terminal from the application list. Once you are in the terminal, you can type in help to access a list of all the commands available. So if I type in help, it gives me all the commands that are available. When you start your session through the terminal, you will start in the home directory for your user, which is nothing but a directory that is specifically set up for your particular user. You can verify this by typing in pwd and this will show you the current directory for your particular user. For my user, this shows up as slash home slash labit and if you have a username test, it will show up as slash home slash test. Now, to look at the contents of your home directory or any other directory you are in, you can type in the command ls which is list and it lists files and folders in the current directory. Folders are generally blue in Ubuntu and files are generally white. ls is probably the most used command in Linux so let's have a look at some of the options available for this command. To get a list of all options, you can type in ls space minus minus help and hit enter and this will show you a description of what the command does. So it lists information about the files the current direct in the current directory by default and it sorts the entries alphabetically if none of the sort options are spe specified and the usage is ls any option that goes with it and file right so let's have a look at some of the options 
ls minus h option small h will display the contents in a human readable format now let's try this out so if we type in ls minus h it will show the contents in human readable but because we already had the contents in human readable you can't see the output if you want to reverse the sort order we can type in ls minus r and this will reverse the order as you can see desktop was here and videos was here and now the orders reversed actually and another option is minus l which will display the results in a long list format which includes some information about files and directories such as permissions owner group size and date modified so let's have a look at that so if i type in ls minus l it gives me the permissions for that directory the user for that directory or file the owner of that owner group of that file or directory when it was modified the date and time and the name anything that starts with a d is a directory and anything that does not have a d is a file next if you want to see hidden directories in your folder or you have to use an option ls minus a and this will show up all the hidden files and directories in linux terminology hidden files and directories have a dot in front of them so anything that has a dot in front of them will not show up um, in the default view to list the contents of the files or directories in your current directory that have a dot you have to type in ls minus a now let's use all these commands at once so if i go ls minus l a r i'll get the contents of my current directory in long list format including hidden files and directories and the sort order reversed right now one more option that is handy is minus s as this option allows you to display the size in allocated bytes so if i type in ls minus s on my directory it gives me the size of those directories in how many bytes were allocated to that particular um, file or directory one thing to note here is that these commands are case sensitive so small s is different than a capital s so let's try that ls minus capital s and it did something else so let's have a look at the options again So small s will give you size but capital S will sort by file size with largest file first. So that's probably what it did. It sorted it by largest size first. So let's have a look. Let's minus s. We've got the size and ls minus capital S. We've got the sort. So examples for desktop because it was the largest size is at the top. And as usual, we can club these commands together and we can make it like this ls minus l s and maybe if you want to reverse the order like this. This brings us to the end of this lecture and I will see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hey guys, welcome back. In this lecture, I will show you how you can access help while you are in the terminal. So. There are two options first is man and second is help what man does is it takes you to the manual of that particular command and it keeps you within that manual until you press Q so if I type in man space command name so ls takes me within the terminal sorry within the manual of that command and it gives me the name of that command the usage so I can type in ls then I can input some options and then I can give a file name and description which is a long description of what this command does 
and then some arguments that I can pass or options I can pass with this command. If I go right at the end, it gives me the exit statuses for this command. So zero is okay. One is minor problems were encountered with the execution of this command, and two is there were serial serious troubles with this with the execution of this command. It also gives me some information about the author, reporting bugs, and copyright. And to exit, as I mentioned, is Q. Similarly, minus minus help will display the manual and return me back to the prompt. So if I go up, I've got usage, description, and I've got all the options available. Now, if you want to know what commands are available for you, so if you don't know what the command is, or what, what command you, you're going to use, what you can do is you can type in help at the terminal and this will give you a list of all the commands that are available for you. So you can look up a command here and then you can go and look at the options available for that command. So I'm going to show you something. So let's pick a command from this. So if we pick echo, and I've chosen this because this is special. So if I pick echo and I type in minus minus help, let's see what it does. It's just printed out minus minus help here. So minus minus, minus help is useless for echo. But if I type in any other command, so if I type in time and then minus minus help, it gives me the time it took to execute that command. So you don't have minus minus help for each available for each of these commands but what works is man echo and this will take us to the manual and we can see that what it does is it echoes the string to the standard output right so if we get out this is what happened so we echoed it with minus minus help and it just displayed that to the standard output so let's have a look at man on time So it runs the program and summarizes system resource usage. And that's what it did. So it tried to run the command name minus minus help, couldn't find it, and it gave us the time it took to uh, come up with this error. So now you know manual can be can come in handy in some cases. Minus minus help can come in handy in other cases. Now another thing I want to show you is if I type in help and go right up, I get the version of the bash and tells me I can use info bash to find out more about the shell in general. So let's do that. So if we type in info bash, it gives me information on the shell itself. So I've got the name, synopsis, so bash options command string file and gives me some description of the bash some options I can use with the bash command itself so I can do things like debugger I can dump strings etc I'll get out of this type in help again go up and I can Type in min minus k or info to find more about commands not in this list. So let's do that. So let's type in info and hit enter. And this takes us to a man page which has more commands. Like we can type in, we have editors like nano and other commands. So we'll quit out of this. Now, the last thing I want to show you in this lecture is. If you're working and you've got a lot of stuff on your screen and you want to clear your screen and go back to a prompt, you can type in clear and hit enter and it clears everything from your screen. With this, we are at the end of this lecture. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hey guys. Let's talk about files in a Linux system in this lecture. In a Linux ecosystem, everything is considered as a file, which means not only your regular files like your text files or images are considered as files, even your directories are considered as files as well. So directories 
are just some special files that can store other files in them. To understand this, let's have a look at this picture. This is the picture of your directory structure in Linux. It has the root directory as the top and because directory is a special file that has cons that can store other files in it, root directory can have other files and because directories are also files, these other files could also be directories and they can in turn have other directories creating a whole structure of directories on your file system. Now, the next type of files in a Linux ecosystem are special files. And these are called special files because they perform some special functions. The first type of a special file is a block file. A block file provides buffered access to your system hardware components, which means they provide a method of communication with the device drivers for your hardware resources through the file system. So they allow your system to talk to your hardware resources through the file system using files. An important aspect of block files is before, because they are buffered access type files, they can transfer a large block of information at any given time. Now to search for all the buffered files in your system all you've got to do is open up your terminal type in ls minus l so ls is list minus l provides the list in a long format and we do that on slash dev which is your device directory and then we do this now we'll talk about pipes and grep commands in Linux a bit later but for now just understand this a pipe will take the output of this command and give it as input to this command and so what we do here we list all the files in slash dev directory and then we search for that list for file names that start with b so this caret is wildcard for starts with and we hit enter so we've got a list of all the directories. We've got our loops from loop 0 to loop 24. We've got the SDAs, which are our device files, sorry, disk files. And we've got SR0, which is our CD-ROM. So SDA is disk file and CD-ROM is SR0. Now the second type of file that we need to talk about is a character file. A character file is also a device file, but it provides unbuffered serial access to your system hardware components. So just to repeat that, character files provide unbuffered serial access, whereas block files provided buffered access. So what's the difference? In unbuffered serial access, we can only transfer data one character at a time. In block files, we could have transferred a lot of data at any given time, but in character files, we can only transfer one character at a time. Now. To search for these character files, all we've got to do is hit the up arrow and then replace B with a C in our command. And we've got all our character files. So on the left hand side, you see the C here highlighted in red. These are all character files. So we've got our TTY terminals here. We've got user input etc as a character file now let's talk about symbolic links next symbolic links are nothing but references to other files on the file system which means symbolic link files are just some files that point to other file now to have a list of symbolic links all we've got to do is hit the up arrow and replace c with an l and it will give us all the symbolic links in our device directory. So as you can see, we've got our CD-ROM, which is SR0, our core, which is slash proc slash k core. Now standard error is slash proc slash self slash fd slash 2. So processor on self and 2, just remember this number. We'll use these numbers extensively 
when we do the um, video on scripting standard error is the when you run a command and if that command has an error so it results in an error that error is returned to standard error standard out is the output of that command so for example the output of this command was printed on standard error which means oh, sorry standard out which means standard out is this right so standard out is slash proc slash self slash ft slash one and error is two now we can also create our symbolic links so to do that let's do this touch file.txt what touch does is touch creates an empty file so we've got our empty file here now let's point this file to something else so let's go ln ln creates a link minus s makes that link symbolic now to get help on ln you can type in man ln and hit enter and you can see ln make links between files that's the usage of it ln whatever option you want and then target and because we want to create a symbolic link we use minus s which is a symbolic link we get out of man using q so once in man hit the q button and it'll take you out so we can type in ls ln minus s and we give it the name of our file file.txt because we want to create a symbolic link for this file and then we want to call the link slash home slash labit slash my linked file.txt right and if i hit enter it will create the symbolic link now to list this symbolic link we go hit the up arrow until we get to the command that we used here now we'll modify this command by changing the directory to the directory i created my symbolic link in which is my home directory so i'll type in home slash labit and i hit, hit enter and as you can see my linked file.txt is file.txt now to demonstrate this i'll go file.txt i'll explain what vi does is but vi is basically just a text editor hit enter we'll talk about text editors in a later lecture but i'll say for now i'll say this is a test file that i have created to show symbolic links and i can do cat on this file right and then if i to a cat on slash home slash library slash my enter you can see i edited file.txt with this line but when i try to read this file my linked file it also shows this line this is because my link file.txt is referencing file.txt so how, i hope you uh, understood the concept of a symbolic link now the next type of special file is a piped or a named pipe now we've seen the usage of pipe when we did this to transfer the output of this as an input to this so basically pipe allows inter process communication by connecting the output of one process to the input of another so we've seen the usage of pipe now we can also list all the pipes in a linux system by typing in 
L S minus L and we can grab on caret P. So we can see we, I've got one pipe here. You can create a pipe using M K F I F O and give the pipe a name. Right? And you can pass some data onto the pipe using echo don't worry if you've not understood the command I'll be explaining these commands later so this is for now I'm just um, doing this to show you the usage of pipe now the next type of files I'm going to talk about are socket files. Socket files are files that provide a means of inter-process communication but they transfer the data between processes running on different environments or different machines. So the difference between pipe and a socket file is that pipe allows inter-process communication between processes running on same environment and socket files do it on processes running on different environments. Now you can have a look at all the socket files on your system by typing in ls minus l grep and then caret s. So I don't have any um, socket files for now. But an example of a socket file would be when you open up your web browser and go to any um, web server. So for example, if I go to yahoo.com or google.com, what essentially I've done is my system communicates to this um, web server using socket. And they are generally used by um, programmers. So this brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you like this video and I will see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hey guys, let's talk about directories in Linux. To create a directory in Linux, you need to type in mkdir space directory name. So mkdir space directory name. So if I type in test, I'll create a directory name test. Now to get into this directory, you can type in cd space directory name cd is a short form for change directory so cd and as you can see my prompt straight away changed from tilde which is the home directory of my user to test now once you're in the directory to go back to the home directory of your user you can type in cd space tilde and this will take me to the home directory of my user or to go one level up we can type in cd space dot dot and that will take me one level up. But just to further explain this, let's create a directory structure under test. So cd space test. And then I can do mkdir test one. I can go cd space test one. Right. So I've created a directory structure where I've got my home directory and then test under the home directory and then test one and then test two. So to go one level up, which means if I had to go from test two to test one, I can type in cd space dot dot and that will take me to test one. If I have to go to the home directory of my user, which means if I need to go to this tilde, I can type in cd space tilde. Now, if I have to go to the root, which is the point in file system where everything resides, which is the, that means it is the first thing in a file system, I can type in cd space slash, and I'll be at cd space place slash. So if I type in pwd here, I can see that this is the first point in my file system. Now, this leads us to the concept of absolute and relative paths.
An absolute path is defined as specifying the location of a file or a directory from the root directory. So from here. In other words, we can say absolute path is a complete path that starts from the start of an actual file system which means that an absolute path will always start with a slash. So let's say if you want to go to test2 and want to give the absolute path, I can type in cd space slash home slash labit slash test slash test1 slash test2 and this will take me to S2. So this is an absolute path. Now to understand the concept of a relative path, let's go back to the home directory of my user, CD tilde. Now a relative path is defined as path related to the present working directory. So I'm in my home directory, so pwd slash home slash labit. If I type in ls here, to get, get into let's say documents, I can either type in cd space slash home slash labit slash documents, right? Or because I'm already in slash home slash labit, I can just type in documents. And this becomes a relative path because it's relative to the directory I was already in. Now you'll be thinking, oh, okay, that's easy. Then why would we need an absolute path? We'll need an absolute path in cases where if you're in a certain directory, but you want to run a program or open up a file which is located in another directory, and you don't want to change the current working directory you're in. So for example, I'm in CD documents. Now, if I do an ls here, I don't have anything, but let's create a document. And I'll say this is file demonstrates oops fat fingers the use of absolute and relative paths. So I've got a file name myfile.txt under documents now let's go to my home directory test test1 test2 so now I've switched my context from documents to s2 now this here was a relative path because it didn't start from a slash so it didn't start from root so that's why it's a relative path but then back to the um, absolute path um, use case now i'm in test 2 i'm doing something right i'm talking to my linux system using echo command right and i want to now without switching my current directory from test2 i want to now go and read the contents of my file.txt i can use the absolute path so i can go cat space slash home slash labit slash documents slash my file.txt so one important thing you can use is so if you're in home slash labit so I'll, you can use tab to auto complete your command so if you type in slash and then h you can go into home and next you can type in l and then hit tab you can go into my username or whatever your username is so you can hit the first letter of that and hit tab and then to go to documents i can type in capital d and hit tab and this will wait a while and then give me some options so i can see it's telling me uh, there's not enough information for the system to autofill this because desktop documents and downloads all starts with a d so i have to provide some unique 
um, identifier for this so I'm gonna go to document so I'll type in DOC and hit or tab and that allows it to auto complete it and now my file is called my file.txt so I'll and that's the only file so I can type in M and hit tab and they'll auto complete the file I'll hit enter and you can see that I'm in the same directory test 2 but I can still read the contents of this right so let but you can then say oh we can use the tilde why do we need to do a home lab with documents and then you might be in some other directory so you might be in let's say you might want to see a list of commands using ls bin right so you wanna, without you want to still stay in your um, test2 directory but you want to list the contents of the bin directory which is under root so you can get a list of all these and you're still in test2 so i hope that's uh, made the concept of absolute and relative paths clear now next thing is if you want to delete a directory what you can do is first if your directory is empty so i can do an ls on test2 and i know this is empty so i'll go one step up so test1 ls it's got test2 in it and we know test2 is empty to delete it i can do rm minus t which means delete a directory and test2 but before that I'll let you see the help for the option i used so rm removes or unlinks the file minus d is removes an empty directory minus v is verbose it explains what's being done minus i small i is prompt before every re removal and minus f is force so don't tell me just do it so let's have a look at each of these so to delete test2 which is an empty directory i can do rm minus d and then test2 now if i go one level if i create something else so if i go the touch file one dot txt under test one and make sure the file one's there you can go cd dot dot ls now we know because file one dot txt was under test one that makes test one a non-empty directory so if i type in rm minus d and then test one see it gives me a prompt that you can't do it because the directory is not empty so to remove a non-empty directory i can type in rm minus f and then the directory name and make it recursive so minus r is recursive and this will allow me to forcefully delete the a non-empty directory now recursive will also delete any directories that are inside a directory so you've got to be very careful when you're using minus r and minus f options now let's go one level back and let's try and delete this time using minus i option so rm minus i and do it on a directory and test so it will now ask me before deleting this directory so if you've got any important directories that you know you you want it to prompt before it deletes the directory you can use minus i option now this ends this lecture about directories in linux i will see you in the next lecture where um, i'll talk about directory structure i hope you enjoyed it thank you for watching bye hey guys let's talk about directory structure in linux in the linux system the start of a file system is a directory called root or slash and every single file or directory that resides in a linux system resides inside this root directory only a special user called root can write to this directory now there are multiple subdirectories under root so let's talk about each of them slash bin contains user binaries for commands that you will run under a single user mode so for example commands like copy commands like list etc so 
to access these commands all you got to do is go to your terminal cd space slash bin and do a list and you can see the list of all the commands under slash bin so you've got commands like list copy cat which is to read the contents of a file now all the commands that a system administrator might use for system maintenance are located under sbin so bin will have single user mode commands and sbin will have system maintenance commands like reboot so to have a look at sbin so just go cd space slash sbin and we can type in ls here and we can see it's got commands like reboot and then shutdown as well so maintenance related commands now the next directory you want to talk about is slash opt and opt stands for optional so what happens is this folder contains any add-on applications that you might want to install on this system for example if you're installing splunk which is like which is a seam to monitor events or you want to install Elasticsearch, which is a search related application you'll install those applications under slash opt next is slash boot which contains files that are related to the bootloader program on the system so bootloader helps you load the kernel into the operating system when you reboot or when you boot the system slash root is the home directory of the root user so you've got three types of uh, root keywords here root represented by a slash which is the starting point of the file system a super user named root which can write to the slash root directory sorry to the slash directory and thirdly slash root which is the home directory of the root user so three types of root one represented by slash is the starting point of file system slash root is the home directory of a super user also called root and that user is the only user that can write to slash next up is dev and this contains all the device related files on your system so if we go back to a terminal and type in cd slash dev do an ls we can see it's got our disk files represented by sdas cd rom etc going back to the slide next directory is slash etc and this directory contains configuration related information for our system for example if i go to slash etc to ls it contains my cron tab and cron tab is a utility that allows you to schedule tasks it also contains my host files so hosts contains all the known hosts of the system and host.allow is like a whitelist so i am allowing these hosts to be able to connect to the system and deny will deny those hosts host name contains the host name of the system going back to the slide next is srv so srv stands for service and this contains server specific services related data so if you have a linux server running and there are certain specific services running on that machine you can the data for that particular service will reside under SRV. Next up is home and this is the home directory for all the users on a Linux system except the root user. Why? Because the root user's home directory is slash root. So just bear in mind this is the home directory for every other user apart from root. So going back so if I type in cd slash home and do an ls i can see there's a user named labit and this is the home directory of the labit user so if i go cd slash labit sorry i use the absolute path so i can see that under labit i the labit user has his desktop documents downloads etc now next is slash temp and this is a temporary directory 
and a cool feature of Linux is anything you put in the temporary directory gets deleted when you reboot your system. So if you're doing some task and you want to download some temporary files that you don't need after you finish that task, you know, once you're done, um, reboot your system and everything under slash temp will be automatically deleted. Next is slash lib and slash lib contains system binary, sorry, system libraries. And these library files support the binaries located under bin and sbin. So these files under slash lib contains the explanation for the Linux operating system on how to handle these commands that are under bin and sbin. Next is USR and USR contains binaries, libraries and documentation for second level programs. So basically all the programs, for example, anything you might want to install like a nano text editor or anything else gets installed under USR and USR contains all the system wide read only files. It also has a bin and an S bin. And so if you can't find a command under bin, you can find it under USR slash bin. And if you can't find a maintenance related command under um, slash S bin, you can try and find it under USR slash S bin. Now the next directory is media and media is nothing but a temporary mount for your media related uh, files for example your cd-rom or your usb a similar file directory is slash mnt and sem slash mnt is a temporary mount directory where system admins can mount file systems now last is slash where and slash where contains files that are expected to grow over time for example your log files so as you can see it's got it's cache log spool and temp so let's have a look at the contents of where so if we go back to our terminal and go to cd spa space slash where and hit L ls and we go under cd log we can say it has the kernel log the dpkj log authentication log system log etc now this brings us to the end of this lecture i hope you've enjoyed it thank you for watching Bye. hello and welcome in this lecture let's talk about some file operations and let's get started by reading the contents of a file. What I've done is I've downloaded a sample file from internet which is located under the downloads folder for my user here and I've also uploaded the same file as a resource on this lecture so you guys can download this as well and we can all practice together. So let's get started. Once you've downloaded the file, open up the terminal and make sure you are at the tilde prompt and type in cd space tow and hit tab that will take you to your downloads folder if you're not at the tilde prompt then you can hit cd again and then type the absolute path for your folder so for me the absolute path is cd space home space slash labit slash downloads or you can do like this cd space tilde space downloads and this tilde represents the home directory for your user so it represents home slash labit once in the downloads directory you can hit ls and you can see the file now you can type in head space the file name to view the initial 10 lines of the file so this head space file name will display the first 10 lines of the file you can see the options available under head command by typing in head space minus minus help and this will open up the help page for us so if 
by default it prints the first 10 lines of each file and various options available for this command are minus c bytes minus n or the number of lines minus q quite which means silent never print header giving file names minus v is verbose and minus z is zero terminated so let's try minus n so what we can do here is we can type in head space minus 20 and then the file name and this will display the first 20 lines of the file now the opposite of head is tail and tail displays the last 10 lines of the file by default so these are the last 10 lines of the file again like the previous command we can type in tail minus minus help and this will give us the options for tail now an option I want to talk about is minus F or follow it outputs the appended data as the file grows so this is very handy when you're working with log files log files are files that are generated by system processes or applications and they tell you what's going on in that process or an application so let's say you you're you you're working as a Linux administrator and you know some application is not working and you want to find out why you'll go in and start reading the log file but you might only be interested in the data that's coming in at that point in time and you can do that by typing in tail minus f and then file name and you'll get the data as it comes into the log file so let's simulate that let's get back to our prompt typing in tail minus f and then sample dot text you can see we have the last 10 lines of the file and our prompt is waiting for data to appear on this file so what we can do is we can open up a second terminal window and from this window what we can do is we can go into downloads and use the VI editor which is the default editor application available for us in Linux and hit enter so I'm at the last line on the VI editor so what I can do is I can hit I here and this will take me into the insert mode which means now I can edit this file I'll put it a couple of spaces uh, new lines and then I'll type in this is a sample line to demonstrate tail minus F feature and once I've typed my line in I can hit escape and then colon and once I'm at the colon prompt which is this one I can type in W which means write this file Q and then exit and exclamation mark so again escape colon W Q exclamation mark and this will modify the file and exit out of the editor and as soon as I've done that you can see that on this terminal window I can see my modified line as it was appended to this file now let's get out of this by typing in control C next command you can use is more which displays the file one page at a time so you can type in more sample.txt and this will display the file one page at a time we can go down by typing in spacebar but let's exit out of this first and type in more space minus minus help now we can see the help page for more file and we can see the various options available for us so like minus F will give you count logical rather than screen lines minus L will suppress pause and minus will number the lines per screen full and plus will display file beginning from line number now an alternative to more is less command and less command allows for backward navigation so more did not have a backward navigation you could only go forward 
less allows you to go forward and backward both and it allows you to also have single line navigation so let's do that so less space sample.txt now we can hit the space bar to go forward and we can hit control b to go backward sorry capital b to go back one page and you can use the arrow keys for forward and backward navigation as well so let's go down a few pages and now let's go back up using the capital B and then go up or down using the line navigation now we can get out of this by typing in Q now to get help on the less command we can also type in less minus minus help and it gives us the keys available for us to utilize during the less command so so caret b capital b will allow you to move backward one window one window or n lines space will move forward one window but it doesn't stop at end of file capital d will go forward half a window and you will go backward half a window so let's get out of this now to display all the contents of a file you can utilize cat command and this information will scroll on the screen if it does not fit your screen so if I type in cat space sample.text it will display all the available data on this file on my screen you can also create files using cat to create files using cat all you've got to do is this cat and then this sign and then a file name so let's create a file named sample one.txt and hit enter and now we can type in some data so this is a sample file to demonstrate creation of files using cat command and then we can do control D to write this and get out of it now to view this file just do that again and we can view the output of this file as well now to get help on cat command all you've got to do is cat minus minus help and you can see the help page so cat actually means concatenate files to standard output and the various options are capital A to show all minus B number non blank minus N will show file the lines of in a file with a number against them so if we do cat minus n sample dot txt we'll see that each line will have a line number against it now we can also do cat file name and the new file name and we can see that this will concatenate the contents of these two files so what we'll do is cat sample dot txt sample one dot txt and hit enter and you can see it concatenated the contents of that file sample dot txt with the contents of sample one dot txt so this and above was part of sample dot txt and this was the line we added in sample one dot txt this brings us to the end of this lecture i hope you liked it and i will see you in the next lecture bye Welcome back. Let's talk about different text editors in Linux and to begin with let's talk about the default text editor VI. You can create a new file in VI by typing in VI space file name 
or you can edit an existing file by also typing vi and then existing file name. So let's create a new file this time. Now as soon as you enter the vi editor, you'll see these little symbols which are called tilde's and in vi a tilde represents an unused line. If a line does not begin with a tilde and appears to be blank, it must have a space, tab, new line or some other non-vi viewable character. So if you're using this file that you're editing as an input to some other process or program and that program expects unused line at a certain position but your line didn't have a tilde which means it had a space or tab or anything else your program might error out so if you want an unused line make sure there's always a tilde there now there are two modes in vi command mode enables you to perform administrative tasks such as saving the file executing commands moving the cursor etc second mode is insert mode which enables you to insert text into file vi by default always starts in command mode and to enter text in this file you have to hit i and as soon as you hit i in command mode you will see that the prompt on bottom left hand side of the screen changes into insert to get out of this insert mode you can type in escape and you'll see that the insert disappeared. So I to go into insert mode and escape to get out of insert mode. Now let's get into insert mode and type some uh, lines of text in it. Now, once you're in insert mode to delete a whole line where your cursor's at, you can hit escape and D twice. So escape and the D key, D as in dog, twice, and that will delete the whole line where the cursor was at. Now, if you want to only delete text that's towards the right hand side of the cursor you can key in escape key and then capital D so escape and then capital D will delete all the data on that current line towards the right hand side of the cursor now the command to quit out of VI is escape to get into command mode from insert mode and colon Q exclamation mark so Q is basically quit and then hit enter if we do an ls here we can see that my file was not written to the disk because this is quitting a file without saving it so now let's get back into vi mode typing some random text Now if you want to save and quit, I can type in escape colon wq question mark and this will save and save the file and exit. I can do a cat. I can see that my data was saved on the file. Let's and get into VI. Now let's say we, if we want to save the work we've done on the file but we do not want to quit the editor we want to keep working so if i go into insert mode this is a second line and i want to save my work i can type in escape colon and w exclamation mark and this will save my file so i can see my file name here i can see that my file has three lines so this is the first line this line does not have a tilde which means it has white space here and this is my third line really and it has number of characters 
that were written. Now, let's say if you wanted to do a save as on this file. So, you want the third line. but you want to save the extra edited the text that you've just modified into a second file so not in this file but you want to do a save as operation hit escape to get into command mode and then colon and then w which means write this and then space and then you give it a file name my new file dot txt so this will perform a save as operation and save this file in my new file.txt. Now let's get out of this. And if I do an ls here, I can see I've got two files my file.txt and my new file.txt. Now to see the difference between these two files, what I can do is I can do a diff to show the differences. And give it the both give it both files as input parameters and hit enter. And this will basically tell me that this line, this is the third line, is present in this file, but is not present in this file. So that's it's showing me the difference between these two files. Now getting back to VI. Now, if you wanted to move around in the file within the file without changing it, then you must always be in the command mode. Now, let's search for something in this file. So, let's say you're in the file. Actually, let's get out of this file and let's open the file that we downloaded from internet because that has more text in it. Now, we can use two different commands to perform a forward or a backward search. So to match a pattern in the forward direction, I'll type in when I'm in command mode, I'll type in this slash, so forward slash, and then I'll type in the pattern I want to type, so sample. And this will show me the pattern available that is matching to the pattern I've put in my search in the forward direction. If I want to match a pattern in the backward direction, in command mode, I'll type in question mark. And this will show me the pattern that matches in the backward direction. Now, to repeat the search, that was performed previously in the same or opposite direction we can use small n and capital N so I search for the pattern sample in the backward direction using the question mark and what I can now do is I can type in small n and this will go in the backward direction and search for the pattern that I previously typed in or I can hit capital N and this will search in the forward direction now let's do the same thing using forward slash so let's search for try this time and hit enter now I'm at 80% of the file so just to get this and I searched in the forward direction now let's try small n so small n goes in the forward direction which means the direction that I originally searched in and capital N will search in the backward direction for me so you see I'm searching in the backward direction if I look at it here 
now there are some characters that are special characters so special characters must be preceded by a backslash in your search expression so for example if I want to search in forward direction but I want to search for new lines and new line is generally represented like this right I can see I cannot type in new line here I can't type in here because it will search for a text named new line but to search for new lines in my text I can hit backslash n and this will search for new lines and obviously I can do small n and capital N to go forward and backward in my text now let's talk about how you can change the look and feel of your VI screen using the set commands so let's see we want to display the line numbers on our text so what I can do is once in command mode I can hit colon and type set and I can type in NU and then this will display lines with line numbers on the left hand side so the lines in my text now have line numbers now if I wanted to word wrap I can hit escape to make sure I'm in command mode hit colon and I can type in set and then WM and this will word wrap my text now if this option is a value greater than zero then this editor will automatically word wrap for example to set the word wrap margin to two characters you will type in escape w so set wm is equal to two and now you can see my word wrap margin will be set to two characters so if I originally typed in set WM you can see that my wrap margin was set to two characters so this is how you can change the look and feel in your VI editor this ends this lecture on a VI editor I have attached some files with this lecture which contains all the commands that you will need in a VI editor like what is the command to save what is the command to save and quit etc I hope this lecture was helpful. Thank you for watching and I'll save you in the next lecture. Bye. Hey guys, sometimes when you're using VI, you might find it, well, how to say it, not good. I mean, it does the job, but there are other better options out there. So let's just talk about two of these options. The first option I want to talk about is Vim or VI Improved. Vim adds on to the features of VI. Here are some cool features like it has syntax highlighting and support for popular programming languages like Python, Perl, etc. It can be used to edit files using network protocols. It has multi-level undo and redos. You can split the screen for editing multiple files. And it includes a built-in diff for comparing files. There are many other features but let's install Vim on our system for now. So open up your terminal window and type in sudo apt get install vim what this command does is sudo tells the system that the following command needs to be run as an administrator apt get will get the package from ubuntu repository for users of red hat linux they'll use yum instead of apt get so they'll replace apt get with y u m yum so they'll type the command like this but because we are on ubuntu let's type in apt get now install will tell the system what to do with the package so we want to install it that's why we said install and then finally the package name so if we hit enter here it will build some dependencies and then it says it's found the new package that needs to be installed called vim it says the archive had 1152 bytes but once it downloads it and installs it it will consume 2852 kilobytes of additional disk space and then it 
prepares to unpack, unpacks and sets up Vim for us. Once we've installed Vim, we can straight away use it by typing in Vim space file name that we want to edit. So Vim space sample txt will open up the sample.txt file for us to edit. Most of the commands for saving the file, save as, quit without saying, etc. will be similar to VI. So we can just use escape colon Q exclamation mark to edit without saving. And if you noticed in a sample.txt file, there was no highlighting or anything else. So let's open up a script file to show the difference between VI and Vim. So if I type in Vim space myscript.sh, I can see that the text for my bash script was highlighted. So the comments were highlighted or colored in light yellow, light blue. The keywords were highlighted in yellow. The variables are colored in blue color. So it's just better if you're programming in any programming language, VIM, VIM is better than VI because it just makes your life easier. Now let's talk about Nano. Nano has a pseudo graphical interface. Therefore, it is less daunting for new users because you don't have to remember so many keywords. And it has most of its shortcuts listed at the bottom of the window, making it extremely simple to use. It has many other functions like search, search and replace, go to line, automatic indentation, etc. So now let's install Nano on, on our machine. So to install Nano is simple. We just replace Vim with Nano on our command. And the install log shows that it's trying to install Nano. It's finished, so once it's finished, we can edit a file using nano simply like this. And it also it also has highlighted our syntax, but the color is different. So in Vim it used yellow for our keywords. This here it's green, but doesn't matter, it's highlighted. Now a good thing about nano is that all the shortcuts are listed at the bottom. And you can get more shortcuts by typing in control G because control G open up the help window. So you can get other stuff like undo last operation, redo the last undone operation, etc. And you can use control P for previous line, etc. So we'll just close out of the help page by typing in control X. We'll make some changes. And we'll try and exit out of this file. So if we hit Control X again, it says save modified buffer. So basically if I type in yes, it will save the changes I've done. If I type in no, it will not save those changes. So let's type yes for now. Now it says what file I want to write the changes to. So it says myscript.sh. I could change the file and it will be like a save as. So it'll save in a different file. So if I hit here and I do an ls, and I can cat my script file. And I, we can see that it's made our changes. Now let's do nano again. Now to search for something or search and replace something in, in nano, we can type in control and slash, so forward slash, it says search to replace. So let's replace downloads and we want to replace it with documents. So rather than listing all the files in downloads, it will list all the files in documents folder. And if I hit enter here, it asks me for a confirmation. I go, I can do yes to replace a single instance and I can do all to, if I, if I, if it found multiple things matching the pattern that I put in, I can do all and it'll replace everything. So if I type in yes here, we can say it's change, made the change and changed downloads to documents. So we can type control X now, says save modified buffer. 
if I go nope and try and cat it I can see because we chose not to save the buffer or we chose not to override our file it's not done our changes with this we've come to the end of this lecture i hope this was helpful thank you for watching and i will see you in the next video bye hello everyone linux is a multi-user operating system meaning multiple users can log into the operating system at the same time to understand linux it is very important to understand the concept of users and groups so let's talk about it in this lecture users in linux can be of two types human users and system users human users are the people who log into the system and system users are used to start non-interactive background services such as maybe a database service but from the perspective of the operating system there is no distinction between a human user and a system user and all the information is stored in the same file however each user is assigned a unique user id in linux system and the user id range is different for human users and system users so let's have a look at this let's go back to our terminal and let's execute grep uid slash etc slash login dot tefs now what this what this command does is it searches so grep is used to search for keyword uid in this file in this particular location so if we hit enter i can see that the this is the range for human users so between 1000 to 60000 and this is the range for system users between 100 to 999 now the information about users is stored in slash etc slash passwd so let's do a cat slash etc slash passwd to view the contents of this file now this file has a list of all the users configured to access this system we have our root user here and these are all the system users and we can confirm by that by looking at this particular column which is user id for that user and this is between 100 and 999 so these are system users the last user on this list however has a user id 1000 which means this user is a human user as are these two users now let's have a look at the information for each user now this is the username of that particular user the second column is a placeholder for the password of that particular user the third column contains the user id which is unique in the linux system the fourth column is group id so each user in a linux system is part of a group and a group is a collection of all users that perform a similar function for example power users users that have access to read only files finance related files etc and each group contains a group id which is unique for that particular group the next column contains a comment about that particular user for example from this comment i can see that my user is a system admin the next column is the home directory for that user so slash home slash lab admin and the last column is the shell for that particular user now if we look at the root user which is the first user on the file we can see the root user has a user id of 0 and a group id of 0 the comment is that it is a root user its home directory is also root and it starts the shell in bin slash bash now to add a new user all we've got to do is type in user add now let's have a look at the help for this particular command now the help file tells us that the usage is user add 
some options and then the login name for that particular user so let's have a look at the options so we can set the comment for that user we can set the home directory we can set a group id we can set up a we can create a home directory for this user if it doesn't already exist we can set up a password and we can give it a shell so we can also manually give it a user id as well so let's set up a user so we can type in user add and then let's put a comment as new user now let's make it an administrator user so minus g and the group id of administrator user is 1000 so let's make it part of 1000 group and let's make a home directory for this user and let's give it a shell under bin bash let's give it a password as well so just give it my password as password and finally let's give it a username so but we forgot one thing because I'm not logged in as root I need to run this command as sudo so I'll hit enter here type in my sudo password and I think oh yeah so there's a forgot to put a space between password and my user so it's created a new user with password as password and part of the group 1000 and we can verify this by checking the contents of passwd file again you can see I have my new user set up as my user the user ID on this user is 1003 it's part of the group that my labit user which is an administrator is part of the comment is new user has a home directory and that's its shell now you can change the password that was initially created by typing in passwd command and that will ask us to change the password of that particular user so to reset password of some user on the system you need to type in passwd space the username of that particular user now let's modify this user so to modify we need to utilize a command called user mod so user add to add a user and user mod to modify any existing user account let's say you want to change the username from my user to my admin so to do that let's do a sudo user mod and let's look at the help file to see how we can achieve this so the, this is the user mod options so let's have a look minus l will give it the new value of a login name so that's what we need to use so we type in sudo user mod minus l so new is my admin and the old username was my user and we hit enter and let's get the passwd file again and we can see we were able to change the username of that particular user and you can see that the user id and group id were not changed now you can also lock and unlock an account by using minus l and minus u flags so if we go back to the help file you can see minus capital l 
will lock the user account and minus capital U will unlock the user account. So let's try and lock this user account. First, let me try and switch to this user. I can do that by typing in su space minus username. So my admin, I need to give it the username, the password for that particular user. So I'm able to log in as this user now. Let's switch back to the original user. Now let's try and lock it using user mod command. Now let's try and switch to this user. So I'll do it again to make sure that I'm not doing it because my password's wrong. So I can't log in. Now let's unlock this user. See, I'm able to log in now. Now, you can also change the user ID of this particular user. So if I type in, if I go here and exit out, so sorry, su minus labit, and I do the command sudo minus small u. So I go to the help again. So small u will give it a new user ID. And I can give it 1100 and give it a username. So it's giving us an error. So let's try another user ID. Let's see what happens. Okay, it says unable to initialize policy plugin. And that is because I haven't given it the user mod command. So if I type in user mod and change it to 1100, so it says currently user my admin is currently used by process 6848. So it won't allow it because the user's already logged in. So let's switch into that user first. and type in exit to log out the user and now we can so we can kill this user a process using this oops to type in sudo and then scale our terminal so let's open the terminal again and now let's try and do a user mod on that user and now let's do a cat on that particular password file and you can see the user ID of my user was changed to 1100. So we can do multiple edits on a user after it's been created. Now we can use user del command to delete a user. So let's delete this user. So again, let's do a user del. Let's clear this first. Sorry, clear. Now let's do a user del. And let's do minus minus help to see the usage. We can force, we can remove the home directory and mail spool, and we can change the directory using true and remove any SE user mappings. So let's do this sudo user del minus f will force removal of files 
and we want to remove the home directory as well so minus rf and I want to delete my admin right so now let's do a etc passwd and as you can see the user was deleted now there is another way of creating user accounts so let's clear it and that way is if we use the add user command right so if we do a sudo add user and then type in a username it asks us for a password so I let's say password and then it asks us for various details so I can type in the name of the user type in various things like so you have a choice between using user ad or add user so user ad you need to provide some options and values for those options add user you have to provide it asks you for a password it lets you put fill in details like full name room numbers etc now let's have a look at our etc and passwd file for this particular user so you can see the my admin user was created and all the information that we put in was entered into the comments column now that brings us to the end of this lecture I will see you in the next lecture where we'll talk about the super user in Linux. Bye. Hey guys, let's talk about the super user root. Root is the user in Linux operating system that has access to all commands and all files. It has access to the top level directory called root directory. So if we go back to the directory structure in Linux, every other directory in a Linux system resides under the root directory and root super user has write access to this directory which means by then it has write access to all these directories by default as well now root user is also the most privileged user account on the system which means it can modify the system in any way it desires which means it can install software uninstall software delete any file it can grant and revoke access permission for other users it can delete files that are used by other users as well now let's get back to our terminal and if your user is part of the sudo group or is an administrator then they can perform this operation sudo minus i to switch as a root user it might ask for the password of your user account but it didn't in this case because I logged in as root user previously and it remembered that I've actually put in the password a few minutes back. So now let's go into the home directory of user labit. Let's go into downloads. Let's list all the files in downloads. And let's try and remove a file. So let's remove my file right so I was able to log in to a different user as root and I was able to then delete a file in that user's profile as root now let's try and do this when we are a normal user so not root so let's first switch as the normal user now let's try and get into the root users home directory which is slash root permission denied so other users can't access the root users home directory now let's etc onto the passwd file now in this file the first line represents the root user so we can see that this is the username of the root user which is root it is part of user ID is zero. It's part of a group and that group's group ID is zero as well. The comment is root. 
this is its home directory slash root and that's its default shell bin bash with this we've come to the end of this lecture i will see you in the next lecture bye hey guys let's talk about groups in this lecture groups are a collection of users which perform a similar function assigning user to groups makes it easier for us to manage permissions on our system for example you can set permissions to ensure that files accessible by one group of users in your company for example it cannot be accessed by another group for example hr let's say when a user is created by default they are added to a new group with the same name as the username of that user this is called the primary group of that user now let's get back to our terminal Now on the terminal window, we can type in grep gid So we can search for gid in the file login definitions or login.defs and this will give us the range of group IDs available for use on this system So we can see that there are two ranges the first range from 1000 to 60,000 is for regular groups and the range from 100 to 999 is for system groups now all the groups configured on this system can be found under file slash etc slash group so we can cat on this file and this group file has a list of all users configured on this system now Let's look at the information available for us in this file. On each row, the first column gives the name of the group. The second column is a placeholder for the password for that group. The third column is the group ID for that particular group. And the fourth column, which is blank on this group, but you can see here, the fourth column contains the names of users that are member or usernames of users that are members of that particular group. Now let's add a group on this system. So you can do that by typing in group add and the name of the group that you want to add. Let's say I want to add a group named HR. And if I read the contents of the group file again, I can see that my group was added and by default, the system assigns a system generated group ID. Now we can also manually assign a group ID to each group. So let's type in sudo space group add and hit enter and this will give us the options available to us under the group add command. So minus G option will allow us to set the group ID manually for a particular group. Minus P will allow us to set the password for a, that particular group. So let's try the minus G option. So sudo group add minus G space and now we can give it a group number. Let's say 1100 and the group name would be IT and hit enter. And if we read the contents of the group file again, we can see that the group IT was added with a group ID 1100. Now we can also modify a group after we have created it. And to do that, we will use group mod command and let's hit enter to see the options available for us now we can change the group id with minus g option we can give the group a new name with minus n option and we can also change the password for that group using the minus p option so let's modify the group hr and change its gid to be 1101 And let's change the name of this group from HR to let's say accounts and if we read the contents of the group file again we'll see that the group was renamed to accounts and the new group ID was 1101 now we can also delete a group and we can do that by typing in group del command 
and then the group name and if we read the contents of the group file again we can see that the group was deleted now to view the options available for us under group del we can just type in group del and hit enter and we can see we have minus h for help minus f for force etc now you must have noticed that for adding modifying or deleting a group i have to type in a sudo sudo command tells the system to run the following command as an administrator and for my user to be able to run this sudo command it has to be part of a group called sudo on some of the linux distributions like ubuntu and it has to be part of a group called wheel in some other distributions so we'll have a look at both type of systems but let's have a look at the ubuntu system first so if i go into my group file i can see that i have a user sorry a group named sudo and the membership of that group is labit labit admin 1 and my admin so these three users on my system can run sudo command now let's log in to a user who's not part of the sudo group so let's log in as sudo sorry su minus labit admin and hit the password now let's try to run group add command using this user says lack of administrative privileges so let's try and add sudo and enter password it says labit admin is not in the sudoers file this incident will be reported this means that because labit admin is not part of the sudo group it cannot run any command as sudo and now this message also gives us the information about a uh, file on the system the sudoers file now let's get back to the user that can perform sudo by typing in su for switch user and labit and it'll ask me to enter the password for labit now let's try and open the sudoers file it says permission denied but we can override that by typing in sudo in front of the command and we can see this is the content of the sudoers file on a ubuntu system so it says this file must be edited with vi sudo command as root so only root can access and change the values of this file please consider adding a local content in etc slash sudoers.d instead of directly modifying this file so if you want to change this file locally you should modify sudoers.d rather than the sudoers file and you can see the man page for details on how to write a sudoers file as well now you can see here this line tells the system that the members of sudo group can execute any command so this is the group name and these are the settings for that command so it's all 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 which means they can run any command on the system now let's have a look at a non ubuntu system so this is my red hat linux server so let's have a look at the similar files on this server so if i type in cat slash etc slash group I'll be able to see so I'll have to grab on it first got nothing as sudo on this server if I type in wheel I can see that on my Red Hat Linux server in the etc slash group file I have a group named wheel and my user labit is a member of that particular group now on these systems membership of group wheel 
makes a user administrator and if I look at the sudo file for this system I have to run that by typing in sudo I can see here that allows people in group wheel to run all commands and then I have wheel all 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 so compare these two systems on an Ubuntu system we have allow members of group sudo to execute any command sudo and the permissions are all all and on a Red Hat Linux system I have allow people in the group wheel to run all commands so basically two different distributions of Linux handle the administrator groups in two different ways on Ubuntu you have the sudo group and on Red Hat Linux you have the wheel group but regardless you can add new members to these sudo or wheel group in both these distributions so let's have a look at how this is done on an Ubuntu system to do this you will type in sudo gpasswd and then let's hit enter to see options under gpasswd command minus a will allow you to add user to a group minus d will allow you to delete user from a group so let's type in minus a and I want my user labit admin to be part of group sudo and I was able to add this user to the sudo group so if I go back to my group file if I scroll up I can see that under group sudo labit admin is now added as a member which means labit admin can now perform sudo functions now minus d will allow you to delete this user from this group so let's do minus d on labit admin and hit enter and we have the message that says removing user from group sudo and if we do cat atc group again we can see that this user was removed from the sudo group now there's one more method which we can use to add this user to a sudo group or any other group for that matter we can type in sudo user mod so gpasswd would add user to a group user mod will modify user to the group sorry will modify a user and if we hit enter we can use the command options minus a for append and this appends the user to a supplemental group that is provided by minus capital G and minus capital G option gives you a list of supplementary groups so we can utilize these two commands and combine them to add our user to a supplementary group so why it is a supplementary group because a user should be in a primary group which is a non pseudo primary group so let's do sudo user mod minus a for append minus g to provide a supplementary group now because this is an Ubuntu system we will use sudo as the group name and then we need to provide it a username so labit admin and this command will assign labit admin to the sudo group and now if we check our etc slash group file again we can see that labit admin has been added to the sudo group now to validate that labit admin is now a member of sudo group we can log into labinet labit admin by typing in su switch user labit admin put in our password and we can try and run any command that can only be run by sudo cell let's try and perform a group add so sudo group add random group uh, 
and we need to type in our password and let's cat etc group file now now as you can see we were able to successfully make labit admin an administrator on this system and we were able to perform an admin related task now let's have a look at how the same thing can be achieved on a non ubuntu system which has a wheel group instead of sudo so let's go back to our server now on a non ubuntu system let's first have a look at what are the users configured on this system so we have only one admin user so we might have to add a user on this system so let's do that by typing in user add test user but first let's have a look at the options available for us so user add sorry sudo user add and we can provide a password using minus p we can provide a group using minus g we can also provide a home using minus m so let's do this sudo user add and then we'll type in minus m to create a home directory for this user minus p to give it a password let's just call the password password and let's call this user test underscore user and that should add our user now let's have a look at our cat file again now we can see that we have a user named test user with user id 1001 group id 1001 and the home directory for that user is set and it's going to access shell from bin slash bash now because we've got a user here now we can add this user to the wheel group so remember on on the systems that utilize a wheel group as an administrator group we need to add them to the wheel group so on this system we'll again we can do the same thing in two ways so let's try user mod first sudo user mod and if we hit enter we have a list of options again minus small a will append the user to a supplemental group and minus g will give a list of the supplemental group we need to add the user to so sudo user mod minus small a capital g and the name of the group we need to add to is wheel and the user that we need to add to to wheel is test user and we hit enter and if we cat the group file again and then search for wheel if you don't understand what this command is doing don't worry we are just reading the contents of the group file um, the rest of it we are just searching for a keyword wheel in it we'll come to pipe operators and how we can use them later on in this course so now we can see that wheel group has labit and test user as the users that can perform administrative functions on this system now again if we want to delete this user we can use sorry remove this user from the wheel group we can use sudo gpasswd and the options are minus a to add user minus d to delete user so let's do a minus d give it a name so we want to remove test user and the group name we want to remove it from is wheel and if we go back to the wheel in etc group we can see that the user was removed from the administrative group wheel now this brings us to the end of this lecture thank you for watching i will see you in the next lecture bye hey guys let's talk about permissions in this lecture Permissions give you the ability to allow or deny access to content such as files or directories to the users of your system. So, for example, if you do not want user A to be able to access files created by user B, you will set the permissions on file in a way that user A will be denied access.
Therefore, permissions provide a very important tool to secure your Linux environment. There are three types of user-based permission groups, owner, group and others. Owner is the user that owns that file, which is by default the user that has created the file, but you can change an owner of a file as well. Group is a group that that file belongs to and is by default the parent group of the owner of that file. Others is all other users in the system that are not part of the group of that file. Moreover, for each user-based group, there are three basic permission types. Read, represented by R or octal 4, allows you to read the contents of a file. Write, represented by W or octal 2, allows you to modify the contents of a file or directory. And lastly, execute, represented by X or octal 1, allow you to execute the file if it is an installer or a script file etc and view the contents of our directory i'd like to highlight here that to view the contents of our directory you need x permissions on that particular directory now let's get back to our lab system if i type in pwd you can see i'm in the home directory of my user and if i type in ls minus l here I'll get a list of the contents of my directory in a long list format. Now, the first column represents the permission types. The third column represents the owner of that file or directory. And the fourth column represents the group that that file or directory belongs to. Now, let's create a file called sample file. Touch sample underscore file txt if i do ls minus l here again you can see once i've created the file by default the owner of that file is the user that created the file and the group is the parent group of the owner now let's have a look at the permissions the first character denotes special permissions the next three characters denote the permissions for the owner of that file so the owner has read and write access the next three characters denote the permissions for the group which means every other user who is not an owner but is part of the group labit in this case so everyone who is part of the group labit has read permissions on this file and everybody else who is not part of the group labit has read permissions on the file as well now this doesn't seem right does it so let's remove the read permissions from everybody else and we can do that by typing in chmod now there are two ways to do it we can add octal or we can use this way So what this means is I want to remove from group O, I want to remove permission R and then I need to give it a file name. So let's first do it this way and if we do ls minus l we can see that we were able to remove read permissions. Now let's add write permissions to group if we use the same method group is represented by g owner is represented by u and others is represented by o so we want to do it for g and what do we want to do we want to add so we'll use a plus sign and what we do we not need to add so we need to add write permission so we'll use a w and then the file name so sample.file so modify permissions for group and add write permissions on this file so if we do ls minus l again we can see that we were able to add write permissions now to remove permissions 
we used minus as we've used here to add permissions we use plus we can also add multiple permissions so let's add read and write for others on this file as well so we go chmod for others we want to add read write on this so we can do that by using this and we can see now everybody has read write permissions to this file now let's have a look at how we can do these using octal format so in octal format we need to give numbers and if we go back to the slides we can see read is represented by 4 write is represented by 2 and 1 execute is represented by 1 so going back to the lab system let's say we want to give owner read write access so read is 4 write is 2 so 4 plus 2 6 we will type in 6 we want to give read permissions to the group and we can do that so read is 4 so we'll do 4 and we want to remove every permission from others so we'll go 0 and then the file name if you type in ls minus l we can see we were able to achieve the desired result now let's create a directory called test let's cd into this directory let's create another one here called test1 let's get out of it and if we do ls minus l you can see this is our directory right now the owner has read write execute which means owner can read the con uh, sorry read the contents of a file inside the directory modify the contents of the directory and view the contents of a directory as well group can only view the contents of the directory and read the contents of a file inside the directory same for others now what we can do is we can now give the owner read write and execute and let's remove everything from others so chmod and read write execute is 4 plus 2 plus 1 so read represented by 4 write represented by 2 so 4 plus 2 6 and execute is represented by 1 so 4 plus 2 plus 1 is 7 so 7 and let's keep the permissions same for group so read and execute so read is 4 execute is 1 so 5 and let's take everything out from others so 0 and then a directory name ls sorry ls minus l we can see so we were able to achieve the result However, if I go into test directory and do an ls minus l here, sorry, ls minus l, we can see that whatever we did here wasn't done recursively. So any files or directories inside this directory were not affected. Now, what if we want to do a change like this recursively? So we want to make permission similar for any other file or directory that's inside the directory. So we can do that by using chmod minus capital R option on test directory. Hit enter. So if we type in ls minus l, we can see that Test has 7, 5, 0, and if we go inside test to an ls minus l, we'll see test 1 also has 7, 5, and 0. 
Now, let's have a look at chown command. So if we go one step up, chown allows you to change the owner and group of the file. So if we type in chown minus minus help, we can see that the usage of that file is chown options owner and group separated by a colon and we can also do that recursively and we've got all other options as verbose etc as well so let's do an ls minus l so on test right now the owner is labit and the group is also labit now let's change it to labit admin so if to do that we'll use ch on labit underscore admin colon labit underscore admin which is the parent group for labit admin and let's give the file name now if i hit enter let's see what happens it says operation not permitted this is because i need to run this as an administrator user if I do a sudo and type in the password for labit if I do ls minus l again I can see that for test the owner and group were both changed to labit underscore admin now I didn't do it recursively so the user labit should still be able to view the contents of test1 I think Not sure so let's have a look if I can CD into this now permission denied because I'm not part of the group now let's do this let's change the group of this file by typing in chgrp and let's have a look at help first so ch group allows you to change the group of file and we can do it as ch group option group and then file name and these are the options which means we can also do it recursively as well so ls minus l again sudo ch grp and we want to change the group to labit and then test and we also want to do it recursively so we'll do it like this type in ls minus l again you can see that the owner is labit admin and the group that this file belongs to is labit let's see if we can access this file again yes why because labit is part of the group labit which means these permissions r dash x will apply to this user so I can view the contents of this directory because I have X X permissions on this directory but let's see if I can make a directory within this directory permission denied and this is just to test if whatever we did was done recursively so you can see that the first change that we did we changed the owner of this file to labit admin and the group to labit admin and this operation wasn't done recursively did not affect this directory and the second change the change that we did was done recursively so it affected the parent and it also affected the second directory but because the second directory was already part of the group labit we can't see the change now we've seen that how we can change the permission types we now know how we can change the owner of a file we now know how we can change the group of a file let's have a look at some of the special permission types as well the first permission type is d 
and this signifies a directory so if we look at this piece of information we know this is a directory and the preceding D will tell us that it is a directory dash means there are no special permissions associated with this file next is a symbolic link a symbolic link will be used when you want to point your file to some other file in the system so for those files will have L at the start rather than a D so if we were to create a symbolic link using you do that using ls minus l you give file name so let's give the file name as test1 or let's call it sim test and let's give the symbolic link of examples to desktop sorry ln minus s Oh, I'm in the wrong directory first so let's get into the correct directory and try again and then minus s sim test examples dot desktop if I hit oh it's done the other way if I now hit ls minus l so I can see that syntest is a symbolic link for examples.desktop and the first character on the permission type shows L here. Now going back to the slide, the next is set user ID or set group ID permissions. What this indicates is that when you run or execute a file, execute it with users permissions or the groups permissions and you set this by typing in let's say we use test and we run it as owners permissions so chmod owner is you and you want to give it set uid permission So we need to use sudo again. If we type in ls minus l, we can see that under here for the owner's permission type section, s was used. That means we are using special permissions set user ID here. And when this will be executed, this will be executed as the owner, which is labit admin. Now the next bit is sticky bit and sticky bit is used when you're working in a shared environment and what this does is so let's say you've got a directory and you've got files within that directory that are owned by multiple file owners a sticky bit permission will allow you to make sure that only the file owners can rename or delete their files now let's see how we can add sticky bit permissions. Let's say you want to change sticky bit permissions on test. We'll do that by typing in chmod and we want to add sticky bit permissions plus and I'll say t. I'll give it the directory name. I always forget I have to do it using sudo. If I type in ls minus l again. I can see that T was added to this directory telling us that it has sticky bit permissions. This concludes the lecture on permissions. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we will talk about grep command. Grep is used to search a given file for lines containing a match for a particular word or a string. The syntax of grep command is grep then whatever your search term is and then the file name 
Now let's get started. If I was to type ls here, I will be able to see that I have three files and one subdirectory inside my directory. And let's cat on one of the files. So cat on sample.txt. Now we can see that this is the content of my file. Now let's search for something in this file. And let's use language as our search term. Now we can type in grep language as our search term and then give it the name of the file that we need to search in and hit enter and what the system has done is it has printed on the output on my screen the line inside the file that matched the search term and it highlighted the search term in red now I can see in this particular line it matched the search term twice here and here but it did not match the search term on this one this is because by default grep is case sensitive to ignore cases on grep command we can type in minus i and then the search term and then the file name and if we hit enter now it has matched the first occurrence of language as well because this time it is ignoring all cases. Now you can also grab on multiple files. To do that, you need to type in grep, then the search term, then the first file name, and then the second file name. And if we hit enter now, it will list out all the lines where it was able to match the search term and it will give us the name of the file in which that line resides. So it matched language on two lines inside file new, new file.txt and then it matched language on a single line inside the file sample.txt. Now let's have a look at help options available for us in grep. So the usage of grep is grep, then any options that we need to type in, the pattern for which we need to search, and then the file that we need to search for this pattern in. And there are multiple different types of options available for us. Pattern selection options help us select the way it will find the pattern inside the file. So for example, if we want to ignore case or not, if we want to use extended regex or if we want to give it the pattern from a file. Miscellaneous gives us some miscellaneous options such as selecting non-matching files rather than matching files. Output control gives us the ability to control how the output will display. So for example, if you want to search recursively, if you want to print line numbers with the output, if we want to suppress the file names or if we want to just print the count so we can control the output of the search command context control allows you to control the context for example you can change if we want to use markers to highlight matching strings or not now let's have a look at pattern selection options first We've already seen how ignore case works. So now let's have a look at minus F option. This option allows us to obtain pattern from a file. So if I do ls again, you can see that I've got a file named patternfile.txt and what I've done is I've added some patterns for search in this file and these are all separated by new line. So I can use this file to search sample file. So I can do that by typing in grep minus F and supplying the pattern file name. And then this file I want to search for the pattern in. If I hit enter here, I can see that it has given me the lines which match these patterns in this file. Now going back to the help 
menu again and this time let's look at one of the miscellaneous options so let's look at inverse match inverse match selects non-matching lines rather than matching lines so if we type in grep minus v and language in sample.txt it will display all the lines that did not had this search term in now going back to the help option let's look at one of the output control men options so let's look at how we can search recursively first so recursive allows you to search within any subdirectories inside your directory so if i was to type in grep minus r and give it the search term and now because we are searching inside directories we don't need to provide it a file name and I can just hit enter saying it's not able to find anything and this is because there's a syntax problem my search term did not add the correct spelling so let me search again and now we can see it found the search term on two lines in file new file.txt then it went inside the subdirectory test and was able to match on this file on a single line and then it found the same pattern on this directory as well so this is how you can search recursively now let's have a look at the help option again now we can also display only a count of selected lines per file so let's do that so grep minus c and as you can see it was able to find this pattern on one line inside this file and it was able to print the number of lines it matched the pattern on here now let's club these two commands so we can club minus c with minus r and we can remove the file name and hit enter and we can see now we've got an as an output that in new file.txt it was able to match this pattern two times and on all other files it was able to match the pattern once now we can also use minus n option to print the line numbers as well so as you can see it was able to match this search term on line number seven in this particular file now this brings us to the end of this lecture i hope you enjoyed it thank you for watching and i will see you in the next lecture bye hey guys welcome back in this lecture i will talk about find command which is used to search and locate a list of files based on the conditions that you specify and then perform some actions find can be used with variety of conditions such as the user that's the owner of the file size of the file date that it was modified etc now let's have a look at find command you start by typing in find as the keyword then specify a path where you want to find the files in so dot means current working directory slash means start with the root and you can specify absolute paths as well so like this and then an expression so i want to find files by name and then a search pattern so let's say now if i were to hit enter it will return the file that matched this particular pattern now I can also use wildcard characters with this. So if I wanted to return all files that had a .txt extension, I could use this. And what this means is anything followed by a .txt. And 
as you can see in my home lab it downloads I have two files that have a .txt extension now let's show the usage of dot which means current directory it has given me a list of all files with start.txt or .txt extension in my current directory so it has found files in my documents in my downloads some Mozilla files etc now by default minus name option is case sensitive so for example if I was to type in abc.txt I've only got a file which matched this particular pattern which was in lowercase but as you can see here in the big list I have two files which could have matched the pattern if this was case insensitive so to ignore case with minus name I can type in minus i name and it will return the results and ignore cases while returning them now I can also find directories with find command to do that to use find and then dot for current working directory and then minus type D is for directories F is for regular files so I can type in minus type D and I can further filter that by minus name and then capital D O and then star and what this command will do is it will find directories with names starting with capital D and O and anything after that so it's gone ahead and got me two results that matched this particular pattern now I can also find files based on permissions so let's say I want to find files with user as read write group as read and everyone else as read as well so I can use that permission by typing in find dot minus perm for permissions 644 so read write read read and I just want to find text files with those permissions if I hit enter you can see all these files have these permissions and let's just double check so ls minus l in current directory and let's say documents so you can see 1 2 dot 1 2 and 3 dot txt all have 6 4 4 as the permissions now we can actually get an opposite match so all the entries that did not match the pattern and we can do that by typing in the exclamation mark before the file and let's give it a path so we don't have extra results so go and find in my documents all the files that do not match permissions 644 and let's just take away the minus name option and you can see that it counted my folder as well and it gave me permissions.sh because permissions had 7 6 6 as permissions so we could include minus type D and only find the directories or minus type F and we'll only find files now let's have a look at how to find files using the owner of the file we do that by typing in find in current directory minus user and we give it a username so again it has gone ahead and found two matches for that particular user and we can type in ls minus l and we can see that we have a file with that user as owner and a directory with that user as owner now let's have a look at some of the help options for find so in the help menu for find we can see the usage find some options path and expression and default path 
for find is the current directory default expression is to print on the standard output we have some tests for example name permissions modification time etc and then we can also do some actions for example we can delete files after finding a list of those files or we can execute a command let's try and delete files so in the previous option let's delete files that were owned by user labit admin so find user labit admin and then minus delete and this will delete both the file and the subdirectory so I wanna make sure that only delete the file I hit enter if I do an ls again you can see that the file capital abc.txt owned by this user was deleted this brings us to the end of this lecture I hope you've enjoyed it thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video Bye. hey guys let's talk about how we can manipulate the results of a command or an application using redirections in Linux any program that you run has three important components standard input standard output and standard error standard input provides some input to the program for example a command that you might type in the terminal standard input is represented in Linux by 0 standard output represented by 1 is the output of that program for example the results that you get when you hit enter after typing a command lastly Linux has standard error which logs any errors that are generated if the system is not able to run a command standard error is represented by 2 now we can use various redirection techniques to manipulate how these are handled for example we can make a command output its results into a file instead of printing them on screen so let's head back to our lab to get started now as you can see in the terminal I'm in my documents folder if I was to type in ls here I'll get a list of files in my current directory on my screen if I was to redirect the results of this ls command into a file I'll do that by typing in the command ls and then greater than sign for redirection and then the file name where I want the results to be redirected to so let's call it myfile.txt now once I hit enter you would have noticed that I did not get an output on screen this time because I redirected the output into myfile.txt so if I was to cat myfile.txt I can see that the result of ls command was redirected to this particular file now one thing to note is that by default a single greater than sign overrides the existing data so let's remove one of the files and let's run the redirection command again and let's cat my file.txt one more time now as you can see this was the original data this is the modified data and this command has overwritten the existing data in this file now if we want it to append rather than override we'll use two greater than signs so ls two greater than signs and then the file name and if I cat this file this time you can see I have appended data into this file rather than overwriting it now these redirection techniques come in particularly handy when we are working with applications or scripts now I have a script here error script.sh and if I was to view the contents of this particular script don't worry about the commands in the script itself because we'll be covering these in the video on scripts but for now this particular command 
will result in a standard output and this particular command will result in an error because this is some garbage piece of code that I've written. I can run this script by typing in dot slash and then script name and as you can see I have one line of standard output and one line of standard error. Now I can redirect the standard output by typing in the command to run the script and then one because standard output is represented by one in the Linux system. So going back to the slide. Now we can redirect it using single greater than sign and let's give it a name. Let's call it out.log. And if I was to run this command now, you can see that this time we only got the error printed on the screen because the output was actually redirected to out.log. And we can view the contents of out.log to validate that the redirection was completed. We can redirect standard error in the same way. So we hit up arrow to go back to the command that redirected the output. And let's modify this command to redirect error. So standard error is represented by two. So two greater than sign and then error.log. And we can hit enter. And this time we've got the output on screen rather than error because error was moved into file error.log. Now let's clear it because we need a clear slate for the next one. Now we can also club these commands together. So we can type in the command to run the script and then one and then greater than sign and then out dot log and space to greater than sign and then error dot log and this will redirect the standard output to out dot log and standard error to error dot log now if we wanted to append rather than overwrite existing logs we'll use two greater than signs and also by default one is the default behavior of redirection techniques so we can remove the one and we'll have similar results so if i was to hit enter now and if i was to get out.log first and we've got this file has a standard output twice because we were appending the second time and we can read the contents of error.log in a similar way Now let's clear the screen again. Now in the next scenario, let's talk about the scenario where let's say you wanted both standard output and standard error to go into a single file. We can achieve that by typing in the command to run the script and then the command to redirect the standard output to out.log and then to tell the system we want to redirect standard error and then single greater than sign and then ampersand and then one and what this piece of code will do is it will tell the system that redirect the standard error to wherever the standard output has been redirected to which was this file and if I was to hit enter here and if I was to read the contents of out.log my expectation is that this time it will have the standard error as well because I'm using an append and sure it is we've got the standard error going into out.log as well so again the command to run the file the command to redirect the standard output to out.log and the last piece of code is the command that tells the system to redirect the standard error to wherever standard output is redirected to. With this, we've come to the end of this lecture. 
I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hello and welcome. Let's talk about redirection using the pipe operator. A pipe is a form of redirection that is used in Linux to send the output of one command or program to another for further processing. Let's have a look at this picture to understand this better. Here we've got three commands that we need to run but we need to run them in a way that the output of the first command is the input of second and the output of second command is the input of third command. We can achieve that by using pipe operator. Now pipes are unidirectional. That means the data flows from left to right through the pipeline. And a benefit of using pipes is that we do not have to use temporary files to move data along. Now let's head back to our lab. Now if I was to do an ls on my current directory, you'll see I've got so many files. What if I wanted a count of the number of files in my current directory? I can achieve that by using ls to list all the files in my directory and then pipe to pass the output of ls command to the next command and use a word count and the option lines, which means this command will count the number of lines in the output of ls and if I hit enter it says I've got 14 files. Now what if I just wanted the first three files in my directory. I can do an ls and then pipe head for first few files and then minus three to give it the first three files only. And here you can see I've just got the first three files. Now if I wanted the last three files I can type in tail minus three and this will give me the last three files in my current directory. Now an important use of pipe is when you are reading log files. Now let's say I need to read this file out.log and if you can see it has some output lines and some error lines. What if I wanted to filter everything else and I wanted to only see errors in my log file. I can do that by typing in less to read the contents of the log file. So less out.log and then I can pass the contents to a grep command and then I can grep on error. And this way I will only get the lines with errors in my log files. Now I can also do this. I can type in less out.log and then use pipe to grep on error and I can do a redirection to let's say filtered out.log and what this will do is it will take the contents of out.log filter out everything apart from errors so I have just some errors as the output and then write those errors into another file called filtered underscore out.log and if I read the contents of filtered out.log you can see I've just got the errors so rather than printing the errors on screen I can use this way to write the errors into a separate file from one of the existing error files that I was investigating with this I have come to the end of this lecture. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hello and welcome everyone. In a Linux environment, we have multiple compression formats available to us. TAR combines multiple files into a single file archive. It is very useful when you want to transfer files between machines. ZIP is usually a compressed archive file. GZIP files are files that are compressed using GZIP instead of ZIP. GZIP is a better compression format than ZIP. tar.gz is nothing but a combination of tar and GZIP, meaning you can combine multiple files into a single file archive and you can also compress it using the same command. So now let's head back to our lab system. Now as you can see I'm in the downloads folder on my lab system and if I was to type in ls-l here you can see I've got 
four files and a subdirectory. If I was to zip one of these files using the zip utility, I will type in zip then the name of the new zip file that I'm going to create and then the name of the file that I want to compress and if I hit enter you can see that I get a message saying it deflated the file by 59% which means it reduced this file's size by 59% when it zipped it into a compressed file so let's do an ls minus l here and as you can see it created a file called test.zip with size which was roughly 40% of this file's size. Now to unzip this file, I need to type in unzip space the name of the zip file. And because the file already existed, it asked me if I want to replace the file or I want to rename it. I can type in rename and it will ask me for the new name. So I'll type in pi.txt. If I do an ls minus l, you can see I have a file named pi.txt which is nothing but this file. Now to use gzip, I will simply type in gzip and then the name of the file that I want to compress using gzip. So uk-500.csv. If I type in enter and do an ls here now. You can see that it created a gz file. If I wanted to do an ls minus l to get the size, you can see that the size of the .gz file was a bit smaller than the size of the zip file, which means if you want smaller files while compressing them, you will use .gz. Now, to unzip a file that was compressed using, using .gz format, you will type in gunzip space the name of the file so uk-500.csv.gz I do an ls minus l you can see that I got my original file back now let's move on to tar so to combine multiple files into a single file archive using tar we will type in tar minus c to create a new file archive v to make the operation verbose f tell the system that this is a file then the name of the new tarball let's call it archive.tar and then a list of files that will make up the tarball and hit enter if we do an ls minus l here you can see that it has created for us a tarball out of these two files now, to also compress these files, when we are creating the tar, I will simply type in tar minus c z to compress the files, v for verbose, f for file, and in the name of the tarball, I will type in archive.tar.gz to specify that this is being compressed using .gz format, and hit enter. And this will create for me a new tarball with compressed files. So if I do an ls minus l, you can see that I have created a new tarball which was much smaller in size than the uncompressed tarball. In fact, this is smaller than the individual file sizes. So it has two files which are both individually bigger in size than the compressed tarball now to extract a tarball we need to type in tar minus x for extract v for verbose f for file and the name of the tarball now we can also add minus capital c to give a path if we do not want the tarball to be extracted into the same directory so let's extract it into downloads and then the test folder underneath downloads if I hit enter now I can go into the test folder do an ls there and you can see that this command extracted these two files 
inside the test folder. With this, we have come to the end of this lecture. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next lecture. Hey guys, let's talk about a very important utility in Linux called cron. Cron is a time-based job scheduler daemon which executes the commands at the right time. For example, if you want to take weekly or daily backup of your important files, then you will use the cron daemon to schedule tasks for backup. Cron tab or cron table is a list of commands that are scheduled to run at regular intervals using the cron daemon. Now let's head back to our lab system. Let's type in man cron tab to open up the manual page for cron tab. Now there are a few important things here. First, each user on a Linux system can have its own cron tab. And these cron tab files are located in this particular directory, var spool cron cron tabs. However, these files should not be edited directly. You will need to use cron tab minus e command to edit these files. Next, to control which users on your system should have or not have access to cron tab, you will use slash etc slash cron dot allow or slash etc slash cron dot deny file. So if you have 10 users in your system and seven of them are allowed to have to use cron tab, you will put those seven in cron dot allow file and the other three in cron dot deny file. So this way you can control which users can access cron tab in your system. However, by default, all users of a Linux system have access to cron tab. Next, let's have a look at some of the options available inside cron tab. Minus L will display the current user's cron tab on standard output. Minus R will remove the current user's cron tab. Minus E will edit the current user's cron tab. And minus I will prompt you before it removes the current user's cron tab. So it will ask you if you are sure you want to remove the cron tab. So let's exit out of this. Now let's first try and display the current user's cron tab, cron tab minus L. And you can see there's no cron tab for current user. So let's create one. Cron tab minus E will edit the current user's cron tab and it will display the default editor of your system. For me, it's nano. For you, it could be Vim or VI. Now, each line is an entry in cron tab command and is run separately. Those lines which have hash symbol in, on the left hand side of the, them are commented out, which means these lines will not be run. Now, the structure of a cron tab command is first you need to type in the minute, then you need to type in the hour that cron tab command would be run. Third, you need to type in the day of the month so first second third up to 31st and then you need to type in the month in from 1 to 12 so 1 being january and 12 being december and then the day of week so sunday monday tuesday so sun for sunday you can type in zero or you can type in sun for let's say friday you can type in five or fri and then the command that will be run so for example in this example, this command is run at 5 a.m. And how it is at 5 a.m.? For the minute part, it is 0. So at 0 minute. And then 5, which means 5 a.m. Because this uses the 0 to 23 convention. So 5 is 5 a.m. and 17 is 5 p.m. And then you have a star. And star means any value in this particular field. So each day of month or every day of month and every month and then one is for Monday so Monday 5 a.m. and I've also put these values in this table so you can reference this table when you're practicing and back to the lab system let's try and put a command in which will be run every minute to do that we need to type in star for minute star for hour, star for day of month, star for the month, 
and star for day of week so five stars in total and then the command so let's type in touch and let's create a file home lab it documents let's call it cron underscore test dot txt so what this command will do is it will create a file called cron underscore test dot txt every minute and if I save this and I type in cron tab minus L you can see it has displayed my cron tab command on standard output now I can either wait for the next minute for this to run and I can type in ls and see that the new file was created which by the looks of it was already created or to verify that a cron tab entry was run or not I can type in grep I should clear this first so you can see it better now I can type in grep and then cron in capital slash var slash log slash syslog so what I'm trying to do is I'm searching for every line with cron in the syslog file and this will give me all the entries which were run by the cron daemon so as you can see at 651.01 this command was run now apart from this if I do this again because it's 652 there should be one more entry so you can see there's two entries now now let's remove this user cron tab because I do, obviously I don't want this to be run every minute to do that I can type in cron tab minus r and this will remove this user cron tab so if I type in cron tab minus l again you can see there's no cron tab for this labit user so if I type in cron tab minus e to edit cron tab and let's say I'm typing in the backup command so let's do a system backup of all the users on this system at maybe 11 o'clock on Sunday night to do that first I need to get out of current users cron tab because if I'm backing up all users data I have to add these entries in the root users cron tab because root user will have access to all users so I can type in sudo cron tab minus e and this will now open the root users cron tab not the current users cron tab and here for a 11 p.m. Sunday night backup I need to type in 0 23 star any day of month any day of any month and then sun for Sunday and the command would be tar minus zcf so z is zip and create an archive and I'm going to save it in let's say I'm going to save it in slash where slash backups so exactly the command from above and tgz and I want to back up the home directory which will have all the users data so if I type in this command now just to demonstrate that this was root users cron tab if I type in sudo cron tab minus l you can see that this commands present but if I type in cron tab minus l there's no cron tab because we use you sudo while we were creating that cron tab this command was added into the root users cron tab now another thing I want to dem demonstrate is the use of this utility cron tab dot guru you can use this utility to validate the time sequence that you put in so because I put in 023 star star and Sunday you can see that it tells you in plain English what time this command would be run so let's give it some funky value so let's call it instead of 023 I want to do it at 23 and then maybe 21 on first day of the month and on the second month and the day of week could be anything so this would be run 
at 21.23 on day of month 1 which means the 1st of February. So this will be next run at 2019 February the 1st at 21.23 hours. So this way you can validate your cron tab entries before you put them in cron tab and wait for them to actually run. With this we have come to the end of this lecture. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hey guys, from here onwards things will start to get a bit more complicated as we start to do more technical stuff. Therefore, you will need to have a solid understanding of all the previous topics that we have covered so far because you will need to recall that knowledge fairly quickly in the advanced sections of this course. First, I would like you to quickly recall that a repository is a storage for packages, both source and binary, which is accessible via internet to install any required software on your computer system. You can also create your own repositories if you so wish. Now, a package management system is a collection of software tools that automates the process of installing, upgrading, configuring and removing computer programs for an operating system. The package manager that you will use depends on the system you are working on. For example, Debian users will use DPKG which is Debian package manager, Red Hat users will use RPM and Ubuntu users use Synaptic package manager. Since most of this course we have used Ubuntu so far, we will use that as our lab system again. Therefore, we will use Synaptic package manager. Now with the basics out of the way, let us head back to the lab system to install some software. Now on the lab system, before we install any software, let us create a snapshot of this machine because in case you stuff up, a snapshot will be a necessary fallback. So go to machine and then take snapshot. Call, some, call it something, let us call it our first snapshot. Give it a description. This is our snapshot before installation of applications and hit OK. And this should start the snapshot of this virtual machine. Now we have created the first snapshot. Now we can go ahead and start installing applications on this box. To do that, there are two ways. First, we can do it through Ubuntu Software Manager, which is a GUI application. And the second way is to do it through the command line. I will show you both ways in this lecture. First, to do it through the Ubuntu Software Manager, we need to click on this orange Ubuntu Software icon. And this will open up the Ubuntu Software Manager for us. From here, to install any application, what we will need to do is we need to simply search for that application here. So let's say we want to install Visual Studio Code. I'll type in Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code is an IDE or Integrated Development Environment. So to install this software, all you need to do is click Install here and this will start the installation process. And obviously it requires admin privileges, so you need to type in your admin password. What I'll do is, I'll pause the video now and wait for the install to finish. Now once the installation is finished, you'll have two icons, launch and remove. Launch will launch the Visual Studio Code software and remove will remove this from the system. So we'll hit launch to launch this software. Now this is what the Visual Studio Code looks like. So I'll minimize this now and we'll move on to installing software through the terminal window. To do that, we'll need to open up our terminal client. And from the terminal client, let's try installing Chromium browser, which is open source alternative to Google Chrome. To do that, we'll need to type in sudo apt install chromium browser. So what's happening here is sudo tells the system that whatever's following will be run through administrator privileges. apt is the package manager. So people who are using rpm will use yum instead of apt. You can also type in apt get. So apt dash get instead of apt and it will do the same thing because apt get will go to the internet and download the software as well. 
but I'm pretty sure Chromium's in uh, Ubuntu's repository. So apt and then install is telling the system that this is an install operation and then the name of the application that you want to install. So I'll click on enter and type in my admin password and this will start the installation of Chromium web browser for me. So what I'll do is I'll pause the video now and wait for the installation to finish. So it looks like the Chromium web browser was installed on this system. So let's open up that browser. So click on show applications and click on Chromium to open up the Chromium web browser. Now this is what the Chromium web browser looks like. It's pretty much like Google Chrome, but it's an open source alternative to it. So what, I'll, what we'll do is we'll close this web browser. And now to remove any application from Ubuntu or any Linux system, what you'll do is you'll type in sudo apt remove and then the application name. So let's remove Chromium. So sudo apt remove Chromium browser. Now you must be wondering what apt is. apt is just a short form for advanced packaging tool. It's a packaging tool for uh, Debian systems. So you'll utilize that. For users who are working with Red Hat, we'll use yum instead of apt. So I'll hit enter now to remove Chromium browser from my machine. And actually I want to show you one more thing. In order for you to be not prompted during the install, so you know how it's asking me, do you want to continue? If I don't want this, if I don't want the prompt, what I can do is I can pre-enter the prompts. So I can do that by typing in minus Y. And what this is telling the system is that whenever there's a prompt for yes or no, just say Y and continue with the installation. And this way, this installation won't prompt me for anything. So I can start the installation, go for a cup of a coffee or anything else. Now, while this is going on, what we can do is I can show you how to remove applications through the software manager in Ubuntu. So click on the Ubuntu software manager. And to remove any application through the software manager, you need to just search for that application and click on remove. This will ask you for your administrator password. And once you provide that, it will start removing the application from your virtual machine. So it has started doing that. And I think our Chromium browser should be removed by now as well. So these are the two ways through Software Manager and through the terminal window that you can install or uninstall applications on your Linux machine. This is it for this video. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye. Hey guys, let's get a bit more technical in this lecture and let's install MySQL Server on this machine. To do that, let's first update this system. To update the system, all you need to do is type in sudo apt update and then minus y and hit enter and then type in your admin password and this should update this system. Now, this will tell you that all packages are up to date when this is finished as a confirmation that your system was upgraded to the latest and greatest. Now, to install MySQL server on this machine, all you need to do is type in sudo apt install mysql-server and hit enter. And this should start the installation process for MySQL server on this machine and hit yes once. Now, once your SQL installation is finished, before you can start using MySQL, what you need to do is you need to run sudo mysql underscore secure underscore installation and hit enter. And this will allow you to set up a root password for MySQL. So I'll hit enter here 
and type in the new root password I'll just type in password and now you can read through these prompts for example if you want to remove anonymous users or if you want to disallow root login remotely and all that but I'll just enter through these things once I've done this I will type in sudo mysql admin minus p minus u root and then version to get the version of mysql and now when it asks for my password I will type in the root password that I put in when I was running the secure installation so password and this gives me the version of mysql server installed on this ubuntu machine to log into ubuntu sorry to log into mysql you need to type in sudo mysql minus p minus u root and then when it asks for a password you need to type in password and this will take you to the mysql prompt so i'll exit out of this now when you install mysql it is actually installed as a service so to check the status of the sql server if it's running or not you need to type in systemctl status mysql and make sure that it is an active or running state with this we've come to the end of this lecture thank you for watching i will see you in the next one bye hey guys in the previous lecture, we used systemctl status mysql to get the status of our mysql installation. Now, systemctl is a central management tool for controlling the init system. And the init system initializes the components that must be started after a Linux kernel is booted. And also, it manages the services and daemons for the server at any point while the system is running. So basically, if you want to Tell the system that boot these four components after the kernel is booted you'll use the init system and also if you want to manage your services for example if you want to restart services on the linux server or if you want to stop the services you will utilize the init system and to control the init system you will use systemctl command so it's a pretty important command now as we know to get a status of any service on your machine you will type in systemctl status let's use mysql as an example mysql.service and this will give you the status of mysql service now systemctl is smart enough that even if you omit the dot service part it will understand that you're referring to mysql.service and it will display the status of that service now, to stop a service, you will type in systemctl stop mysql and this will then go ahead and stop that service. To get the status of this service again, I'll hit the up arrow and hit enter. And as you can see, the service is actually inactive. Now, to start the service again, I will type in systemctl start mysql. What I'll do first is, I will type in sudo. So it remembers that I'm running these operations as administrator. Now, let's hit the up arrow again to get the status. And as you can see, the service is active now. Now, to restart a service, you can type in systemctl restart mysql. And this should restart the mysql service. And if I get the status again, you can see that it restarted that service now if your application is smart enough that it can reload its configuration without restarting the service 
you can utilize the reload command and to do that you will type in systemctl reload mysql but mysql cannot be reloaded without restarting services so even if i hit enter here it will give me an error that it can't do this because this application type doesn't support this so for those applications that support a reload feature you can use the reload feature rather than restarting a service which is uh, service impacting so if you are not sure if your application supports reload or not what you can do is you can type in reload or restart so to do that let's type in systemctl reload dash or dash restart and this will based on the application reload it or restart the service and for us it would have restarted the service now the above commands that we've used are all useful when you are in the server and the server is already running and you need to maintain the server for example if your application is down or if you've done some changes and you need to restart the services in order to apply those changes but let's say you need to reboot the server and you want the mysql application to come up as soon as the server is rebooted automatically so you don't have to manually go in and start the service you know what if you have to um, do it at 12 o'clock in the night that's and you can schedule a restart but you'll need a mysql administrator to do things so to automatically boot the service up what you can do is you can type in sudo systemctl enable mysql and what this will do is it will add mysql to the lib systemd systemd which means it will add a symbolic link from the systems copy of the service file into the location on disk where systemd looks for an auto start file so what that means is that it creates a symbolic link from the services directory to the auto start files so when the system boots next it it runs the services that are in the auto start files automatically so now your sql server should boot up automatically you don't have to go in and boot the sql server now to disable the services from starting automatically you can type in disable instead of enable and this would remove this from the auto start files now you can also use systemctl to check if an application is active or not so to do that you can type in systemctl is dash active mysql and this will tell you if the application is active or not so let's try and stop mysql first and then run is active so as you can see you can use is active to check status as well so let's start mysql for now now if you are not sure if an service or application is scheduled to be automatically started on system boot you can utilize is enabled so you can type in is enabled as well and remember we disabled this so that's why it's telling us that mysql is disabled so to do that we can actually enable mysql and then we can check so remember is enabled tells you if the application is scheduled to start automatically on system boot it doesn't tell you the status is active tells you the status so is active tells you the status is enabled tells you 
if the application is scheduled to boot automatically. Now, to list all the applications that are installed on this system as service, you can type in system sudo system ctl list units and this will give you all the applications that are installed on this machine which is too many to count actually so a better way is if you want to know if a particular application is installed as a service on this machine or not you can grab for it so sudo system ctl list units and grab mysql and this will only give you the status of mysql service now this gives you loaded active running and then the name of the server now if you want to completely disable the service so you don't want to uninstall or remove the application but you want to completely disable it so that it will not be started at boot or automatically or it cannot also be started manually as well in order to do that you can type in sudo systemctl mask mysql and once you do that it creates a symbolic link of mysql service in slash dev slash null so let's try and get the status of mysql first and let's try and stop this now if I try and start it what happened is that it failed to start mysql service because mysql service is masked so once you've masked a service unless you unmask it there is no way you will be able to start the service so with this way if you want to keep the application installed on the system but you don't want anybody to accidentally run the application you can mask that application now if you want to display dependencies of an application you can type in sudo systemctl list dependencies and then the service name and this will give you the dependencies of that service now let's try something else so you can see that our syslog service has these following dependencies now if you want to know more about a particular service so you want to display display more information about a service you can type in systemctl cat mysql and let's first unmask this so we type in unmask and let's try and start this service again let's try and run a cat against mysql and as soon as we run a cat we get more information about mysql service for example the description the install the service type the user the group of that service etc etc with this we've come to the end of this lecture thank you for watching bye welcome everyone in this video let's talk about processes in linux a process is an instance of a program running in linux so when you type in pwd on your terminal and hit enter it creates a new process each process is identified by a pid or a process id this is unique for a process as long as the process runs now to get information about processes on your system you need to type in ps and this gave us all the running processes for my machine now to get some more information about these processes i can type in ps minus f and this gives us some more details like UID which is the user ID of the user running that process 
PID, which is the process ID, PPID, which is the parent process ID, which means, for example, we have typed in PS minus F from the bash terminal. Therefore, the parent process ID for PS minus F would be the process ID of bash. And as you can see, PPID for PS minus F is similar to PID for bash. But for bash, it has its own parent process ID. Now, S time is the start time of the process and CMD is the command that initiated the process. To get some more information about PS command, you can type in man PS and it gives you some details like PS reports a snapshot of current processes. This version of PS accepts several kind of options. For example, it can accept Unix options, it can accept BSD options, it can accept GNU options. And then if you go further down, it gives you some examples like PS minus E will see every process on the system. PS minus EF will give some more information about every process on your system. To see every process on the system using BSD syntax, you can type in PS minus AXU. So we'll try that. Let's try it. So PS minus AUX or A AXU, you get to see every process on this system. And it gives you some details like the user that ran that process, the PID, percentage CPU utilization, percentage memory utilization, start time, etc. Heading back to man page. Now, if you go further down, you'll see other options. For example, minus capital N will select all processes except those that fulfill the specified conditions. So you can list processes based on conditions as well. Now, to kill a process, you need to type in kill and then a process ID. So let's kill the bash process. So 10642. If I hit enter, now you see that it hasn't actually been able to kill the process. So we can forcefully terminate a process by typing in kill minus 9 and then 10642 to forcefully terminate the bash window. As you can see, the bash process was killed by using kill minus 9. Now the next command I want to show you is how you can run processes in the background and you can bring them back into foreground. Foreground processes also referred to as interactive processes are initiated and controlled through a terminal session. So for example if I run PS here it's starting a foreground process. Background processes are processes not connected to a terminal and they don't expect any user input. So let's start a process by initiating a tar ball from my home folder and then we can put put it into background and then we can bring it back into foreground so let's type in sudo tar minus czf to create a tar ball and zip it and let's call it test backup dot tar ls do a tar ball of my home folder now once i hit enter and put my password in it will spawn a new process to put this process into background i can type in control z and this will suspend the process and move into background to put it back into foreground i can type in fg and this will bring the process back to foreground now i can press control z again to suspend and put it into background now i can show you how you can keep the process running in background to keep the process and running in background i can type in bg and hit enter and this will keep the process running in the background to get a list of all the processes running in background I can type in jobs and as you can see the process is running in the background now if I hit FG again this will bring the process to foreground so what we can do is we can control Z it and keep it into background and this will keep the process running we can verify by typing in jobs and we can clear the screen and move on to the next part where I show you the use of top command. Top is a system monitoring utility which gives you details like all the processes running on your system, their percentage CPU utilization, percentage memory utilization, command, the time and the nice values. So nice values are the priorities assigned to a process. So a process could have 
one process could have higher priority than the other process so you can change those priorities using nice and re nice with this we have come to the end of this lecture thank you for watching i will see you in the next one bye hey guys in this lecture let's explore the basic concepts and command line tools available for us for network management in linux so let's head right back to the lab system through the gui if you're using the desktop client you can click on the network icon here and then wired connected here and go to wired settings to get to the network settings and on this box you can click on this settings icon and this will then display all the network settings for example the link speed ip address ipv6 address mac address default route dns etc you can also get to the connection name ipv4 details ipv6 details security details now if we cancel out of this you can set up a vpn connection from here so if you have a vpn file you can import that file from here and you'll get all the details from that file so i'll cancel out of this and you can set up network proxies from here so if i type in manual and i can enter all the proxy details or i can type in automatic and enter the configuration url for the proxy now from the command line i can type in ip addr show to list the network interface is attached with this machine and their IP address and other details. So if I type in IP ADDR show, it gives me two network interfaces. One's a loopback adapter and the other's my Ethernet interface. This is the IP address of my Ethernet interface. This is the broadcast address. That's the MAC address. This is the IPv6 address. Now, I can also get these details by typing in nmcli conn and then show so nmcli show and what this command does is it gives me in simple terms what's the connection name the unique id assigned to this connection type and the device and if i just want to show the active connections let's say i've got other disabled adapters on this machine i can type in minus a with this command to get just the active connections but since i only have one connection it will give me only one connection here now you can also change settings so for example if i wanted to add an ip address to my ethernet adapter i can type in sudo ip addr add and then the ip address and then dev and then the adapter where i want to add the ip address and hit enter type in my password and now if i do an ip addr show you can see that it has added the new ip address to set to this adapter as well now to delete this ip address all i need to do is replace the add with delete now if i do an ip addr show I see that the IP address that I added was deleted here. Now, to get some help on IP ADDR command, you can type in IP ADDR space help, and this will give you all the options available with the IP ADDR command. For example, del, add, change, replace, flush, show, etc., etc. Now, to get help for NMCLI, all you need to do is type in NMCLI and then help. And this will give you all the options available for NMCLI. For example, you can use pretty, you can set colors, you can use networking objects, connection objects. For example, we use connection object to show connection. We can use the networking object, so we can type in NMCLI networking and then help. And it gives you the options such as on and off. So what this will do is it will actually just turn the networking monitoring from an NMCLI on or off. You can also edit the connection. So instead of NMCLI con show, 
you can type in nmcl icon edit and this will edit the connection so i need to type in ethernet here because i want to edit my ethernet connection type and you can type in help here and this will give me options for setting values for example i can set ipv4 dot address or i can for example i can type in 192.168.1.1 and i can print the values as well so for ethernet adapter it's given me all the values such as the uuid the type and i can set all these values so all i need to do is to set a value i need to type in set and then for example if i wanted to add a host name i can type in set ipv4 dscp hostname copy paste and i can give it a host name so you can type in my test server and then do a print and this will add these values now exiting out of this because I don't want to save the connection right now what we can also do is we can also get NMC we can also use if config which is a deprecated method so if I type in if config this will give me similar in information but this is deprecated so you need to install net tools to actually install if config anymore but in some old style systems you might need to use if config so i'll just pause this video until it installs if config so the installation of net tools is finished so i can type in if config now and this also gave me exactly the same stuff as ipaddr show so if config is the deprecated method so this for the systems that do not support ipaddr show you should use if config now you can use all interfaces which are currently available or those which are up or down so you can use if config with minus a flag and you can type in if config minus a and this will show you only active connections to get some details about if config you can type in man if config and this will take take you to the man page for if config with this, we have come to the end of this lecture. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next lecture. Bye. If you like this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel.